اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك وعلى طاعتك اللهم إنا نسألك العفو والعافية في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم إنا نسألك العفو والعافية في ديننا ودنيانا وأهلنا وأموالنا اللهم استر عوراتنا وآمن روعاتنا اللهم احفظنا من بين أيدينا من خلفنا وعن يميننا وعن شمالنا من فوقنا ونعوذ بعظمتك أن نغتال من تحتنا اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما ففهمناها سليمان وكلا آتينا حكما وعلما وسخرنا مع داود الجبال وسخرنا مع داود الجبال يسبحنا والطير وكنا فاعلين O oh Allah, O oh changer of the hearts, make our heart firm upon your religion. O oh Allah, we seek your forgiveness and your protection in this world and the next. O oh Allah, we seek your forgiveness and your protection in our religion, in our worldly affairs, in our family and in our wealth. O oh Allah, conceal our secrets and preserve us from anguish. O oh Allah, guard us from what is in front of us and behind us. from our left and from our right and from above us. We seek refuge in your greatness from being struck down from beneath us. And we give understanding of the case to Sulaiman. And to each of them, we give judgment and knowledge. And we subjected the mountains to exalt us along with Dawood and also the birds. And we were doing that. O oh Allah, benefit us by that which you, by that you, has, by, by that which you have taught us. and teach us that which will benefit us and increase our knowledge. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah wa fi al-akhirati hasanah wa qina a'adhaab al-nar. Allahumma khtim lana bi husni al-khatimah wa la takhtim alayna ya Allah bi su'i al-khatimah. Wa sallallahu ala nabijina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin. Allah. Thank you, Ustaz Muhammad Nazreen, the Imam of Zabida Mosque of Easter. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Professor Emeritus Tansri Dato Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Rector IAUM, Dato Dr. Azizan Binti Baharuddin, Director General Institute of Islamic Understanding Malaysia, IKIM, Professor Dato Engineer Dr. Wan Ramli Wan Daud, Professor of Chemical Engineering, UKM, Professor Dr. Ahmad Hafiz Zulkifli, Deputy Rector, Responsible Research and Innovation, International Islamic University, Malaysia, Emeritus Professor, Dato. Dr. Usman Bakar, Al Ghazali Chair of Epistemology and Civilizational Studies, ISTEC IAUM. Deputy Rectors, Deans, Deputy Deans, IAUM Academic Staff, Colleagues, Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the webinar on Towards a New Philosophy of Science for a Sustainable Planet Earth, Islamic Perspectives. organized by International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTEC, International Islamic University, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTEC, is dedicated to engaging in advanced level study and research about Islamic thought and civilization at the national and global levels to nurture comparative cultural and civilizational studies dedicated to the renewal of Islam and human civilization. Its mission is to produce a new breed of academics and scholars who are multilingual and multidisciplinary with a knowledgeable understanding of the universal message of Islam for the advancement of Islamic thought and civilization who can address new challenges and concerns facing the Muslim Ummah and humanity, which will enable meaningful living in the 21st century globalized world. The first of ISTEC's webinar series on the grand theme of sustainable development 
was held on 14th January 2021. The title of that webinar was Islamic Thought and Sustainable Development. The second webinar was held on 24th February 2021, which discussed the topic, the Sharia and the pursuit of sustainable societies as a follow up to the two previous ISTAC webinars, which dealt with the sustainability issues. Today's webinar, the third, also deals with the same issues, but from another aspect. We want the panelists to discuss the philosophy of science that we, the Ummah and humanity at significant need in the 21st century. This new philosophy of science that we are looking for should be in harmony with the sustainable planet Earth for present and future humanity. We know that people are pursuing science for different goals and purposes. Science as a way of studying things and acquiring new knowledge about the natural world is the same for all societies, cultures, and civilizations. In other words, science as a branch of knowledge is universal. However, what science as a collective activity should study and what it should not study varies from civilization to civilization. The choice is culturally determined. In a society where religion is vital, in a society where religion is vital, it has a meaningful say in deciding the societal role of science and its priorities. The collective choice of what is to be given as a priority in society or a nation in the science agenda may also be politically determined. A country can give top priority to science for industrial development or top priority to science for agriculture. Alternatively, it can give priority to science for both sectors in a balanced way. In several advanced countries today, especially the United States of America, a substantial part of scientific research goes into the military sector to produce war machines and destructive weapons. In this case, quite clearly, science is used to serve purposes that are destructive, not only to human life, but also to the Earth's ecological balance. We also have groups of people who pursue science in the name of economic development but are destroying the natural environment and disturbing the ecological balance through their excessive extraction of natural resources. In this case, the greedy rich are financing scientific and technological research to serve their sectarian economic interests in the name of development for all the people. It is the role of the philosophy of science to help human beings to produce science to their benefit. It is the role of philosophy of science to help human beings to produce science to their benefit, helping preserve the planet's earth ecological balance. In the contemporary world, there is a growing intellectual movement favoring a science and a technology only for peaceful purposes and economic development that could serve the needs of the majority of humankind. In our webinar today, we intend to discuss the new philosophy of science for a sustainable planet Earth from the Islamic perspectives. We hope the panelists could enlighten us on how Islam as a religion and Islam as a civilization could provide us with excellent and fresh ideas on the needed philosophy of science in this century, mainly to protect our planet Earth from destruction. It would certainly be necessary to discuss the issue of the purposes of science from the Islamic perspective. Although, 
many people nowadays are talking about the purposes of the sharia maqasid as sharia little is said about their implications for science hopefully some of these implications if not all of them will be discussed by the respected and honorable panelists today all of whom happen to have a science education background since a sustainable planet earth is the issue faced by humanity and not just by the muslim ummah the new philosophy of science as seen from the islamic perspective needs to be brought to the mainstream discourse in our contemporary world an intellectual and intercultural dialogue is necessary on the subject of philosophy of science for our planetary sustainability maybe the international international islamic university malaysia can take the lead in formulating this program and initiating this intercultural dialogue this is because the proposed project involves islamization and internationalization the two areas in which iium iium has expertise and experience international institute of islamic thought and civilization istec is prepared to help contribute to this project today there are philosophies of science there are many philosophies of science nevertheless most of them including the mainstream philosophy is secular meaning that they are not interested in bringing religion into the discourse they are circulating mainly in the west however some of them maintain academic positions that are pretty close to the islamic position on the objectives and role of science in society perhaps more relevant to the islamic perspective on the subject would be the philosophies of science in the other religious traditions for example contemporary buddhism is to be found several formulations of the philosophy of science from buddhist perspective his holiness the dalai lama has conducted dialogues with leading western scientists on scientific issues international institute of islamic thought and civilization istec feels that the project of a philosophy of science for a sustainable planet earth will move forward if dialogue can be held between islam and buddhism on this issue later on other interreligious dialogues on the issue can be held without taking much of your precious time i first respectfully call upon professor emeritus tansi dato zulkifli abdul razak rector iium to open this webinar by sharing his thoughts on the topic towards a new philosophy of science for a sustainable planet earth islamic perspectives fal atafaddal tansri dato the floor is yours tansri thank you very much bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbi ajmain la haula wala quwwata illa billah uh, professor tamim uh, brothers and sisters uh, particularly colleagues from other universities uh, dato azizan uh, and Datuk uh, Wan Ramli. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for participating in the third uh, webinar of ISTEC IIUM, and I would like to congratulate uh, ISTEC uh, to start off with uh, by uh, organizing uh, a series of uh, webinars, which is, I think, relevant to the needs of the Muslim Ummah and also the world at large. Yeah. So this discussion, I think, is a discussion uh, that will help, inshallah, to contribute to new ideas of how we would try to better the world uh, within the philosophy of the university and certainly Islam in, in, in general. Now, uh, I've been invited and thank you very much, but I was also thinking 
whether I should actually participate after looking at the number, the names of the panelists. I seem to be uh, an odd man out, uh, Tamim. So no, it is no. a kind of a punishment for the rector today <laughs> to, to make himself relevant in, in, the, in the discussion uh, that we're going to have. But I am encouraged when I see the word Islamic perspectives in the plural. So I'm not too sure whether mine is philosophy to start off with, uh, let alone whether it's Islamic. In any case, it is something that I believe that I've, I, I think that I want to share with you for more than, for more than a decade now uh, since I started thinking about this in the University of Science in Penang. And maybe there is an extension uh, to what we're going to discuss today. So I would like to thank you once again, all of you, uh, for participating and contributing. And let me uh, reassure, reassure you, this is not a one-off thing. This is something that uh, ISTEC and IEM will take it for a long run uh, until we see the impact that we need to see, uh, inshallah, the soonest uh, that, that we could as far as is concerned. I'm not too sure whether you are able to see my slide. Are you okay now, Tamim? Yes, we can see. We can see Tansri. Okay. It's very clear. Let me, let, me very, let me very briefly say some of the things that you actually know, but just to give a context of where I'm coming from before I make, before I make this conclusion. All right. I think this is something that all of us are, are quite familiar with when we talk about science today, when we talk about education today, and indeed when we talk about civilization today, this is the kind of path that we normally see. Uh, we always start our discussion from the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and hence the modern day uh, civilization. Yeah? And not until very recently, we see crisis after crisis uh, being a, a what called a experience by everybody around the world, the last of which is, of course, in the COVID-19. Yeah? In some of these crises, they will say probably this is just an Islamic world problem or a third world problem or a developing world problem. We in the North, uh, in the West, are doing okay, but you need to now uh, you know, start your, uh, your rethinking and do whatever you need to do so that you can uh, be at par with us. Yeah? But the COVID environment tells us there is no longer a valid sort of uh, uh, justification. And therefore, we will need now need to revise this and to look at it from a different perspective. What I want to add to this slide is basically, is this of this revolution or is of these changes, now we can link it to the so-called Industrial Revolution beginning with seven, uh, 300 years ago, beginning... <clears throat> with the, the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution in particular, we begin to see how the world changed uh, from uh, a very serene, a Holocene sort of era to an Anthropocene era, where we see a lot more uh, problem related to environment, climate change, global warming, and the rest of it, I think I don't, I don't need to mention it to you. And last but not least, of course, to link this back to the latest revolution, so-called the fourth Indus revolution, and how do you deal with this in this particular context, right? Now, one of these ideas, I think, when we talk about the, 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 the revolution today or uh, the, the changes today is bringing back what was left in the context of the Greek civilization. And hence, the word Renaissance is quite applicable because the Greek revolution or the Greek uh, sort of uh, uh, experiences is almost uh, un unseen. Uh, until it is taken back by the Islamic scholars, translate some of their work, and then give to a, another rebirth of a kind of a civilization that we see in, in, in Europe today and indeed all, all, all over the world. Now, what happened therefore, when we now try to dissect it and see whether is this something that is realistic and try to look at the back of this picture of the so-called modern civilization, we begin to realize that it is not just the Greek revolution that is important, it is the Islamic contribution also at the same time, particularly in the 10th century beyond with the Andalusian sort of contribution being the most uh, prominent as far, as far as I can see, and giving this into, into the civilization today. But sad to say, some of this, is, this Islam, Islamic civilization is not realized, it's not seen, and sometimes it's not, it's, not even, it's not even acknowledged, right? So I will, this I think is something that I will not go through. Uh, so we all begin to understand our science and education from this sort of starting point. That is the University of Bologna, in, 1880, in, in 1088, and that is to be the first university in the world 
and they bring a number of ideas of what ed ed education and university is all about. The word university is from the word from the Latin word universitas was introduced for the first time. And the word universitas has a lot of baggage uh, con in, in the context. When we talk about the Magna, Tata, uh, Magna Carta Universitatum, which is a kind of a principle that builds around what a university is all about during that particular time. One of the articles mentioned that universitas must be the trustee of the European humanist tradition. In other words, if you want to use, at least at that particular time, this word university or universitas or whatever derivative from that, you must be the trustees of the European humanist tradition. And hence, whatever we see today is not a surprising thing to us because that is part of the quote unquote condition that you need to abide by if you are so-called universities, given the model of the University of Bologna. I guess this is where the problem starts and we need to understand how do you then dismantle this. Yeah? Uh, the lecture that we're gonna see, uh, and if we have been seeing this, no matter where, including the best university around the world, Harvard, will still have this kind of a profile where there's a man up front and everybody looks at to this man, a kind of a theater style arrangement, which is now the standard quote unquote model of what university looks like coming from this idea of what university is uh, during, during those particular times. Now, uh, what, his, what is that that I've mentioned earlier was basically how much was it borrowed from different civilization, not only the Greek, but other civilization, including is Islamic civilization, now is very well documented in a book called The Theft of History by Professor Jack Goody, who is, I think, the Professor Emeritus uh, in, in Cambridge, and that wrote about, and one of the uh, quote that I'm going to talk about, he says, is highly inflation critic of what he sees, yeah, what Jack Goody sees as a pervasive Eurocentric or Occidentalist bias of so much Western historical writing and the consequent theft, and the word theft is his word, not my word, by the West of the achievements of other culture in the invention of many things, and he no, notably called democracy, capitalism, individualism, and love, and so on and so forth. But the, the whole point is that there are many things that have been taken from different culture, including Islamic culture, that now is not even recognized or not even uh, footnoted in the history of uh, uh, Western education or Western scientific civilization, whatever you want to call it, that you will just simply ignore it. Yeah? This book is already contrib uh, what you call uh, translated in Arabic, and I hope this will also be translated in Basa Malaysia soon, if there is a kind of uh, activity that you want to take on so that the, the, the Malay speaking uh, uh, population also understand where the development is and where the fault lies as far as that is concerned. Yeah, there are certain pictures that I can I can I can uh, use this. This is one of the most uh, telling picture uh, drawn by uh, Hans Holbein the Younger, which is a Renaissance painter, and the and the title of this painting is the Ambassador. And yes, indeed, are the two ambassadors from the West that goes down to the East. And what is interesting in this picture, you can you can practically analyze this that everything here is almost coming from the East including the rock, including the, you know, uh, the, the fabric, including loot, including even, even this time, this is a globe, and then this globe is actually representing what Idrisi is to draw, which in other words, Spain is on the southern uh, sort of hemisphere, not on the northern hemisphere. It is almost an inverted uh, uh, sort of uh, cartography drawn by Idrisi then uh, at, the, at the end, uh, what do you call it, at the behest of uh, King Roger of Sicily, and everything else is in, is in the East. In other words, there is an interaction, there is an influence between the East and Islamic East particularly, and the West at that particular point. And there's so much of this has been taken and brought back to the West, but it has never been acknowledged. And we can see this from another picture. This is a picture just before uh, the ambassador, drawn by Raphael, I think in 1953, uh, what do you call, uh, 19, uh, sorry, uh, 19, uh, 1511. And Raphael draw this picture, the School of Athens. And these are supposed to be the intellectual uh, during that particular time. And if you look at this and analyze every of these personality which has been analyzed, most of them are European. In fact, all of them are European. There's no people, nobody from different, uh, different civilization, different culture, except for this guy here. 
this particular person is actually Ibn Rush. Yeah. And he's this guy, this guy is supposed to be Pythagoras. And, and Ibn Rush is the only person that is drawn, which is not European. But then he's here not as Ibn Rush. He is here as a uh, what do you call uh, Averost, which is the European name for Ibn Rush at that particular time. So anybody who is good, who is not European, are given a European name, and therefore it is taken into the European culture, and then it then becomes is representing of the West. So you have Ibn Sina, you have Al Ghazal, all these are names which is Arabic, but has been vulgarized into Westernized. Western names so that they can be part and parcel of the Western tradition. I mean, I'm starting from the point that the, the tradition of the West do not recognize the other contribution and there are enough documentation to show that there are many contributions from different culture, Indian, Chinese, Islamic, where has been taken by the West and they are not, they're just not recognizing or acknowledging it despite the whole idea that we need to cross-reference, footnote, and so on and so forth at their own insistence. So if I were to redraw this diagram again, I think you've seen this before, all right? We need, if you remove this whole idea of, uh, of the Western sort of civilization, we will probably be able to reduce some of the problems that we see today, okay? And some of the issues are basically looking back at where Islam and Islam's contribution is into this whole uh, phenomena of creating what we call modern civilization the way it is, putting back what has been taken out from the West and putting back, for example, the notion of spirituality, godliness, and so on and so forth, which I'll, I'll do a little bit towards the end before I conclude. So my understanding is this whole organization of so-called education, Institute of Education, including the university, the so-called ivory tower will have to go. I think there is a construct that is not helping the university at all in trying to remake what the education is all about. And indeed, I think this, this construct is not collapsing when we look at the, when you look at the finances or the kind of uh, you know, uh, budgetary concern that everybody is facing around the world. And then it is made worse by the COVID environment that many of the universities now have to close because their interaction with nature, interaction with fellow human beings, and certainly interaction with this creator is not even articulated well enough. And this is a, a concern that I think we need to think of moving the future in, term, in terms of its philosophy and so on and so forth. And all of this crisis, the global crisis, must be linked to education system. I cannot... I cannot believe that we in the education system say that this is not part of our doing. I think in every of the crises, it could be economic, ecological, uh, social, and even uh, geopolitical or military, we are all involved. We, you know about the education uh, system that is failing in managing some of this issue, and the roots is basically how education is organized, how knowledge is organized, and the, base, the basic philosophy that rules knowledge moving, moving into the future. I will just leave it at that uh, for a moment in time. So let me try and, and, and see and, and put uh, my own idea of what uh, the change ought to be. So from the age of reason, we create this whole idea of rational mind that the Muslim, uh, not the whole uh, human being can just solve his own problem using his own rational mind. The thinking, the innovation, the creativity, all this word talks about just that. Yeah. And once the rational mind has gone into something which is good, we will discover something and then we'll start to quote unquote market the, the, the ideas. And that ideas that the marketability becomes a part of colonization. The part many of some of this world, including ours, been colonized because they are introducing their own idea of the rational mind, including the education system. And the education system being since secularized because of that. At the end of the day, I think this whole perspective of spirituality, godliness is taken out. We are now just talking about utilitarianism. The education that we talked about today is about market, marketability, employability, which I'm so against because there's no value as far as spirituality is concerned. And then we are now back into this whole idea what machines can do for us in the question of productivity and productivity becomes, quote unquote, the sole purpose of the university, not creating a better 
better human being, not creating a God conscious human being, and not even creating a world that is actually respectful of nature and so on and so forth. That is maybe around the first industrial revolution that comes about. And in the third industrial revolution, we begin to change just the terminology because people are critical of rational mind Then the new liberals come with another terminology called the human capital, but basically the same thing, right? Instead of talking colonization, now we talk about internationalization. And therefore, when Dr. Tamin talked about international Islamic university, I'm a little bit quote unquote hesitant. What does internationalization mean to us? Are we another group of colonial uh, power that want to colonize other parts of the world? Or what is internalization in our context is a question that I will bring to fore. And finally, we talk about now just machine, we begin to talk about technology, very sophisticated technology in terms of high tech. And everybody now wants to talk about high tech, not knowing what is behind this whole idea of high tech when we go back to, to, to the roots of this uh, so-called industrial revolution. Yeah. So in the fourth industrial revolution, the terminology changed again. So we are not talking about just uh, human capital now. We are talking about artificial intelligence, particularly white artificial intelligence. I underline the word white because most of the AI we're going to receive are created by the West again. And this is a danger that we do not realize that we can go into another form of colonialization by taking that artificial intelligence uncritically thinking that is a solution that we will see because it is technology and because it is because it is called, quote unquote, uh, what you call value free and so on and so forth. Yeah? Now, the voyage of uh, the internationalization now has taken another uh, ecosystem, which is called the cyber world or what I call the cybercracy vis-a-vis uh, -vis democracy. Now, everybody is embracing this as though this is, again, the route to the future that we can solve problem just by virtually talking with one another without human relationship, without face-to-face, -face, without in-person kind of a contact, we think we can survive in that particular case. Again, this is another soft power that will change the whole world if you are not if you are not uh, careful. So the combination of artificial intelligence and the cyber world could define a new world for us as far as that's concerned. And the high tech now becomes the route to globalize that everybody now needs to embrace this high tech the way they defined it. I'm not saying high tech is no good, but I think we need to define the kind of high tech that we want, where what we call in this university, how do you humanize high tech with human touch rather than high tech per se, the way it is understood today. So where do we go from here? The next move, my humble suggestion is basically to start beginning to rechange some of this terminology. Instead of just talking about, you know, uh, the world at large, uh, the secular world, we need to bring some spiritual awareness, God, uh, godly awareness, and not work, on the artif uh, not, not work on the artificial intelligence, but also work on what I call the primordial intelligence, which is now in our language, our fitra. We dump a lot of millions of dollars in, uh, in, in developing I A AI, but how much money do you spend in trying to develop the fitrah of the Muslim, or in fact, the whole human being, the primordial intelligence? I think the, the, the disparity is actually very stark, right? So we begin to pander into artificial intelligence at the sacrifice of our own primordial intelligence as a human being, created by God for his own purpose, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Tamim in his, in his uh, in opening, right? The voice, the voice of discovery should be now the voice of self-discovery. We need to find who we are. What is this person called a human being? What is the purpose of the human being? And the purpose is beyond just the planet, Although we like to talk about sustainability planet, but self-discovery will take you beyond the planet. It will take you beyond even, even the, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the galaxy that we know into a different kind of a consciousness, which I call the cosmic consciousness that connects us to almost everything that is created by God. And this is, I think, the discovery that we need to go through where the spirituality becomes the basis rather than the things that we talk about today in the material terms alone. And suddenly, finally, of course, how do you transcend that self? So in other words, we are not just talking about the rational mind and the, and the intellect per se, but how do you combine with, with another seat of intellect, which is the human heart, the kalb, the kalbu salim, 
Where is this discussed in our in our in our education? Where is this discussed in STEM? Yeah, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Where is the heart there? Where is the human side there? Yeah, we almost secularized it, and that's why we want to change it into STEM, from STEM to STEAM or STREAM, so that the human dimension, the self, is also represented, and the self can be the modulating factor in, in ensuring that technology and science move the way it should move, so that this becomes then the kind of a transcendence that we need to go through. Yeah, from God awareness, then we start our journey of self discovery to know ourselves better. Uh, in in the context of I I U M maybe Islamization of the self, uh, as Professor Kamal talked about it, yeah, and then you can transcend the self as you evolve. That Muslims are being not just uh, are becoming at the same time, right? And we arrive at a balance. The balance could be understood from the Makassid Asharia. I'm not an I'm not an Islamic scholar in this particular sense. Certainly, this whole idea of mizan. The balance between us and ourselves and the environment, the balance between God's centric and everything else, I think, is an important idea that is not taken in as far as science is concerned. Science is still backing this whole idea of a growth, yeah, and growth by nature. Science will tell you itself anything that growth will finally collapse, right? And a good example is cancer. The only the only cells that grow and grow and grow. Is a cancer cell, and you know what happened to a cancer cell at the end of the day. So, if this kind of science that we brought in do not have this idea of the cosmic self-discovery, the heart, the balance, I think that science is support is is going to fail. And I think that failure is already predicted. Let this much. Let me just summarize by looking at the Western construct of what education is science all about. We are now into a global crisis. And that global crisis is very clearly spelled out. Yeah, in a book which I'll share with you in a moment, the loss of understanding of what reality is all about. The reality that we talked about is actually unreal. I mean, this move just back technology, modern human being dependency, total dependency. I must say on 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 technology, as particularly the four IR now. Everybody is talking about the four IR and money and. Our councils have been developed, but there's nothing that will balance it. Our total dependency will will result in a collapse. And now only we are beginning to talk about the reequating of spirit, a spirit supernatural. I I read about a group of people who talk about post-materialist science, and that is probably a re reawakening. But I think that reawakening is nowhere near. Of what we are going to discuss today, because it is not even a mainstream thinking. Only a group of scientists in the West are bringing this out. Yeah. So what do we need to do? This is a book that I think all of us must read. It's a very small book of forty pages, written by Nomi Orokes, which is now in Harvard, and Eric Conway, which is a, a, a journalist. Yeah. And he talks about just this: the collapse of the Western civilization. And in fact, he gave a date also to this collapse will happen in 2093, if all these things that we are talking about, the structure that there is now, is not taken care, the kind of science that we do is not being modulated, we will go into this collapse. And they come from the West and they talk about this collapse. And in fact, the word or the second dark ages are invented by them. In fact, I think we are moving into the second dark ages if you look at what COVID is telling us. As far as that is concerned, so how do you reconstruct this? And my idea is basically to come back to understand how do we evolve, taking in the dimensions of other civilization, not just the Western civilization or the Greek and civilization, but other civilization that has got a different kind of an impact, and that impact will then hopefully grow to another civilization, another dawning of a new idea of what science is all about. And this is what Istek and IIM is, is is trying to do, and hopefully the reconstruction will create a future human spiritual renewal. In other words, bring back what Renaissance has emptied in terms of education, in terms of science, and in terms of civilization itself. Begin to recognize what the understanding of reality is all about. What is reality in our own definition, not in reality in their definition, and start to realize that this whole consciousness, as Tamim talked about, is about rahmatan lil alamin. 
It is not about about us. It's not about a company. It's not about a particular innovation. But it is about how do we reach beyond just those things. And those are the reconstruct that I think we need to think of. And when if you do this well, then I think we will be able to not only uh, move away from the post-pandemic sort of uh, uh, problems that we're facing today, we will be able to reconstruct the new uh, age or the new era and move away from the Anthropocene era that's been predicted now into the sixth mass extinction that is now ongoing where thousands and thousands of species and other lives are destroyed as far as science is concerned. I'm not saying science is no good, but I think science has its limit limitation given the kind of methodology, the modality that it has now. Until we reinvent it and put back what is missing, we will not be able to solve the world problem as such. But I think I stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize for whatever I've said. Uh, if it's not right for for those of you who are very much more uh, enlightened and learned from me, but that's my humble contribution for today. Wabillahi taufiq wa daya wa salamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. That means you need to unmute. Uh, thank you, uh, Tansri, for your uh, enlightened speech. And we have benefited a lot from your speech. Of course, we will discuss during the question and answer session uh, certain things that you have highlighted. But what I wanted to share with you just in one or two minutes is that when I read history of science, I discovered that Greek scientists applied the methodologies of uh, conjecture speculation and assumption. And for about 2000 years, the Greek methodologies were applied by the scientists. Only when Muslim scientists emerged during the Abbasid period, known as the golden era of Islamic civilization, the Muslim scientists invented for the first time the methodologies of experimentation and observation, which have been borrowed by Western scientists, but unfortunately, uh, they uh, did not acknowledge in the way the uh, Muslim scientists should be. With this, we move on to our uh, next uh, panelist, uh, Dato Professor Dr. Aziza Binti Baharuddin. She is currently Director General Institute Kefahman Islam Malaysia. She's also a honorary professor, Center for Civilizational Dialogue, University of Malaya. She is the chair holder of uh, Climate Change, Institute of Climate Change, University of Kebangsan, Malaysia. She specializes in several areas such as bioethics, interfaith or inter-civilizational dialogue, Islam and science, environmental ethics and religion, and sustainable development. She has published more than 200 books, book chapters, monographs, journal articles, and newspaper articles in the above mentioned fields, including harmony between religion and science, an Islamic perspective, environmental ethics in Islam, She's also a co-editor of Islam and Ecology, a bestowed trust and environment, values and the future of civilization. She's active in several governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations connected with her areas of specialization, as well as being a member of various advisory and consultative committees for various ministries in Malaysia. She was appointed by the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, as the chairman, as the chairperson of the National Committee for the Promotion of Understanding and Harmony among Religious Adherents. She was also appointed by the Minister of Science and Technology and Innovation as chairperson of the National Bioethics Council. 
She was also appointed as the Director General of UNESCO as a member of the International Bioethics Committee in Paris between 2014 and 2017. Due to her works and contributions in the area of science and religion, she received an award from the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences, United States of America in 2001. She was also awarded the Federal Territory Mal Hijra Award in 2016. She was a director at the Center for Civilizational Dialogue 2001 to 2011 and professor at the Faculty of Science, University of Malaya until 2015. She was appointed as the Deputy Director General of the Institute of Islamic Leadership, Institute of Islamic Understanding until uh, in 2011. In 2016, she received the Lankavi Award. And her biodata is very, very long, very, very long, thanks to Dato uh, Professor Azizan. With this, may I respectfully invite uh, Dato Dr. Uh, Azizan Binti Baharuddin to share his thoughts on our topic towards a new philosophy of science for a sustainable planet Earth, Islamic perspectives. Welcome, the floor is yours, Dato. Yeah, Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Tamim Usama. Uh, that was a very, very uh, kind introduction. Um, it scares me to death because uh, that's the past. What is critical is what am I now and in the future. So, uh, begin with a small prayer. Alhamdulillah, bil alamin, wassalatu wassalamu ala shafil anbiya iwal musalin wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasrli amri wa luddata milisani ya kaw kawli. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina Muhammad. Yang berbahagia, uh, Meritus Professor Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Rector International Islamic University, Malaysia. Um, Yang berbahagia, Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Osman Bakar, Al-Ghazali Chair of Epistemology and Civilizational Studies, ISTEC IIUM. Uh, Professor Datuk Engineer Dr. Wan Ramli Wan Daud, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmad Hafiz Zulkifli, Distinguished Guests and Participants of this webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum and first of all, uh, thank you so very much to the organizers for thinking, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, wonderful exchange of uh, ideas. I salute uh, Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli for the grand narrative or meta narrative, which I think is very, very critical to begin uh, a discussion such as that we are having to do. <coughs> uh, I think many uh, scientists in their training lack this overall uh, historical perspective that you have given us. And I'm glad to say that, uh, inshallah, what I will be saying will be like uh, filling in some small uh, gaps, not to say gaps, what, what you gave did not contain any gaps, but what I'm trying to say is if what I'm going to be uh, saying this morning, I hope can, can add on uh, to explain, yeah, Professor Tamim, uh, further what uh, Tan Sri was uh, getting at. So the theme for, for the webinar mm -hmm. is Towards a New Philosophy of Science for a Sustainable Planet Earth, Islamic Perspectives. And my tiny presentation is uh, titled Guardianship of the Environment and Islamic Perspective in the, con in the Context of Religious Studies and Sustainable Development. So I'd like to address the theme of the webinar uh, by speaking about this topic. And first of all, I will be stressing the need for religious studies and philosophy, especially philosophy of science and philosophy of religion to reinvigorate their roles in the context of sustainable development and to find their way into the ethical basis of other disciplines such as science, economics, law, and other disciplines. I begin from the premise that just as the physical basis for any society is its bricks and mortar, so too, especially in the human and social dimension of life, there is a need to strengthen the belief and value spaces. Guardianship, I think, is one value or belief that is manifested in action in the form of sustainable development. I will first of all speak on the role of philosophy in the context of religion. Philosophy of religion can be used in two ways, as an exercise in philosophy with religion as the subject, 
or as an exercise in religion where philosophy is used as an intellectual tool. Philosophy is critical because it asks the questions that need to be asked if religious studies, and I think guardianship of nature is one important dimension of religion, are to really succeed in grounding the concept of sustainable development, which is the most recent, <clears throat> the, the most recent expression of sustainable development uh, being in the form of the 17 goals that we are all familiar with. And if you look at it closely, the, uh, the sustainable development goals, I think, can be linked to the Earth Charter, which people began to speak, up, to speak about in the early 2000s. Philosophy can help explain the ethical foundation of principles for sustainable development, or it can help us put into religious studies the idea of sustainable development now promoted by even our own religious authorities as linkable to the Makassid al Sharia. The idea of the guardianship of nature can actually be argued to be the basic principle of the Earth Charter. And as mentioned, sustainable development, as explained by the 17 goals, can in turn be shown to be an important goal of religious instruction. Examples of questions that philosophy poses are, what do we mean? What are our reasons? What lies behind? What are the implications? Such questions help construct a much needed dialogue that leads to the mutual understanding and mutual borrowing that need to take place between the various disciplines currently understood as being embraced by sustainable development. Again, as we mentioned earlier, these include economic, the scientific, the environmental, the social, and the cultural. Such mutual borrowings can be explained in terms of transdisciplinarity, which as some writers um, explain, can lead to a fusion of horizons between religion and science, religion and economics, as well as religion and other fields. As we know, the term philosophy derived from the Greek philosophia, which means the love of wisdom or hikmah, knowledge of the proper place for everything. The quest for wisdom, which cannot be divorced from the truth or haq, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is at the heart of the religious impulse. Humanity has forever been looking beyond itself to find answers about itself. Where have we come from? Where are we going? How should we live? While philosophy asks the big questions, religion provides us with the grand narratives as answers, or at least clues, if not the details. Philosophy also has to ask probing, critical, and analytical questions. And so, the search for wisdom leads to the realm of empirical and experimental investigation and the rise of the sciences. In the Islamic perspective, philosophy, which means uh, uh, something that is speculative, and science, something that is empirical, are necessary for the believer to reach, explain, understand, and manifest the religious state. In fact, the first two are subsumable under religion, which is Islam, which in Islam is called a deen, a total way of life consisting of the physical, mental, social, and spiritual. This idea is also seen in Muhammad Iqbal's description of the four phases of the religious state of belief, which is blind following, questioning, exploration and experience, witness and acceptance. The evolution of the religious consciousness from the first of these stages to the fourth requires the believer to have knowledge and experience of nature and life. This holistic approach to religion and the comprehensive solutions and guidance it is supposed to offer must make teachers and practitioners of religious studies today aware of the gap between the ideal and reality in the understanding, manifesting, and practicing of religion. For example, in explaining the relevance of religion in today's world, many Muslims may still not really understand or are not able to articulate the significance either of the finality of the prophethood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi uh, Prophet Muhammad, or the actual contemporaneous, contemporary nature of their religion as implied by the concept of the Islamic city, for example. These statements are not meant to be part of an apologetic stance, but can be linked to the most recent discourses about the nature of reality currently actively pursued in the Western modern, quote unquote, postmodern, quote unquote, and now post postmodern world. It is critical to begin with this introduction, I think, for a number of reasons. To many in the West, and we cannot exclude the non-Muslim world when we discuss this topic, this way of thinking may be seen to represent a non-Western, non-modern worldview. 
However, it is imperative that we are able to share with the Western and non-Islamic as well as the Islamic worlds the historical fact that the Islamic civilization played a critical role in the development of the West, as Professor Dani mentioned just now, uh, self, and that the heritage of the modern West was not merely the Greco-Roman. The gap perceived between the Islamic and the Western world should not be seen as an insurmountable obstacle to fruitful dialogue, which can be seen as a kind of da'wah on the principle of the guardianship of the environment as a means to move towards the philosophy of science for a sustainable planet. This dialogue is also an imperative today in the context of sustainable development because there is a gap in the understanding of the relationship between man and nature and this vital understanding actually lies at the very heart of the religious worldview. Next, I shall take a little bit uh, of our time to speak about the Earth Charter. What is its message and why is it relevant to us? At the heart of the environmental crisis is humanity's spiritual crisis. It is high time now that despite the successes of materialistic science, we build a unity of knowledge and understanding as the group the disciplines as we mentioned just now, but especially incorporating science, religion, and philosophy. And this will create a worldview and plan of action that is much needed. This is what the Earth Charter is asking us to do for the sake of our future. The Earth Charter clearly sends out a message to the fragmented components of our lost humanity when it says, and I quote, we stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future as the world becomes increasingly interdependent and fragile, the future at once holds great peril and great promise. To move forward, we must recognize that in the midst of a magnificent diversity of cultures and life forms, we are one human family and one earth community with a common destiny. We must join together to bring forth a sustainable global society founded on respect of nature. I will skip universal human rights because that will cause a lot of uh, conundrum among us, um, but Let's look at the, those things that are clearly acceptable to many of us. Uh, respect of nature, economic justice, and a culture of peace. Towards this end, it is imperative that we, the people of Earth, declare our responsibility to one another, to the greater community of life, and to future generations. And this responsibility can be nurtured via the religious principle of guardianship. In a sense, Tansri spoke about Muslims reclaiming their, their, their place in the world center stage. So this, what I'm talking about this morning is a very humble attempt in that direction. I think Muslims must gain confidence in what they need to say, what they have to say, what they can say, and must always be aware that you are not always necessarily talking to people who have Tawheed in their hearts. Yeah, Tansri. So, um, but unfortunately, sometimes some of our uh, Muslim uh, Colleagues and friends, they misunderstand. They think that if you deal in di with dialogue, you're actually selling your soul. So like you said yourself in the beginning, uh, the topic of this webinar is perspectives. So mine is just another uh, perspective as well. The charter also reminds us of our responsibility to one another. In regard to the diversity of human beings, the Quran tells us, O mankind, we have created you male and female and have made you nations and tribes that you may know one another. The noblest of you in the sight of Allah is the best in conduct. And Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. Uh, Al-Hujurat, Ayat 13. Other faith communities should be able to agree that morality consists in conduct that gives practical expression to ethical values, which as a product of religious studies are critically required as the psychological mover of sustainable development today. I think some of us are aware that uh, the importance and the contribution of religion and religious belief in trying to move, uh, impact human behavior in the context of sustainable development is already uh, widely acceptable today. We can look up the literature for this. So the Earth Charter also describes the challenge that lies ahead of us. The choice is ours, it says, form a global partnership to care for Earth and one another or risk the destruction of ourselves and the diversity of life. Fundamental changes are needed in our values, institutions, and ways of living. We must realize that when basic needs have been met, human development is primarily about being more, not having more. We have the knowledge and technology to provide for all and to reduce our impacts on the environment. 
The emergence of a global civil society is creating new opportunities to build a humane world. Our environmental, economic, political, social, and spiritual challenges are interconnected, and together we can forge inclusive solutions. We feel in our bones that we have the solutions for things. Yeah? We, we, we can come up with a new narrative, but we need to band together, especially science, and, and, and which has become, which is, uh, you know, spelt with a capital S, who owns science today? So amongst the Muslim scientists, we need to have this uh, greater awareness, and I think this webinar is uh, one of the ways that we can do this. In Malaysia, the concept of a civil society, or Masyarakat Madani, was actively debated and pursued in the 1990s. Today, the trend continues with the policy of Makasi al-Shari'ah, and Jakim has called uh, one of their projects as I Makasid. In other words, they will try to um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, evaluate, yeah. evaluate how far uh, our ministries, how far our policies are actually in line with the Makassidic framework, which at the same time will fulfill some of the sustainable development goals. So I think this is a very interesting development, and this is where I think we are we are seeing people striving to harmonize religion and development, as espoused by the Quran that says. Allah says, seek the bounty of Allah and celebrate the praises of Allah often that you may prosper. al Jumaah, Ayat 10. Perhaps guardianship of the environment can be concretized in our thinking by us looking at the foundational notion of the gratitude for the gift of life to begin with. In this context, eminent Professor Syed Muhammad Nagib al Atas explains the concept of religion or deen in Islam as connoting indebtedness, submissiveness, judicious power, and natural inclination or tendency. When we are in a state of debt, we are a diana, sorry if I'm not pronouncing this properly, we have to follow the laws and ordinances governing the debt that we owe. A person in debt is also under obligation to a ruler or governor, i.e. a dayan, who is uh, Allah himself, the mighty ruler. Deen is also connected to mad Dana, which means opening or to build cities, to civilize, to humanize, to refine. From Madana, in turn, arise the concepts of Madina, the city, and Tamadun, or civilization, something we are supposed to be enjoying right now. Yeah? Are we enjoying a, a, a good civilization today? In the context of environmental ethics or guardianship of nature and sustainable development, the concept of Deen implies that humans are indebted to the Creator for their existence to begin with and that they already acknowledged Allah as their creator the moment their souls were created. Professor Alatas explains that the nature of this death or creation, of creation and existence is so total that at instance he is created and given existence, man is in a state of utter dependence because he, man, really possesses nothing himself, which means everything in him, from him, and about him is what the creator, the Rabb, yeah, which means who owns everything, owns. This also means that mankind is totally dependent for his sustenance on the sustainer of life himself. This is explained further in the Quran. When thy Lord drew forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify concerning them, themselves, am I not your Lord? And they said, yes, we do testify. Al-Araf, Ayat 172. Because he owns nothing, man can only repay his debt with the only thing that is his, namely his consciousness. It is through this consciousness that he returns himself to the Creator, who owns him absolutely. This is why in Islam, the care or remembrance is so crucial. It is the means for returning and hence for attaining hikmah or wisdom. Hikmah underlies man's thoughts, intentions, decisions and actions, the sum total of which is ibadah, also uh, one of the meaning of, uh, of good works. Ibadah is the original reason for man's creation. To be of service or to do good works, man needs nature or the environment. The Quran explains that this nature has been made malleable or tashkir for him. The environment is the theater for his ibadah. For example, to perform the zakah or tithe, man needs to have worked the environment by farming, cultivation and so on. And for this, he must possess scientific and technological knowledge and skills for the what and how of his use of nature. Nature is not his, but is given to him only for his sustenance, comfort, and entertainment, and as a trust. His relationship to nature is in the capacity of Khalifa or Vajjirin. 
This state of being in which man gives back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mean that man is in some kind of state of unhappiness as a slave because it is in submission that man actually becomes what his inherent nature truly is. In submitting, man returns to his true nature or fitra in which he finds peace and happiness or salam. His returning is in fact again, this is the state of being of the Khalifa, the slave, who is paradoxically vice of the Almighty. Man is also microcosm of the macrocosm. He who enslaves himself gains. Who is that Who is that, that will loan to Allah, a beautiful loan, which Allah will double onto his credit and multiply many times? Um, Al-Baqarah, ayat 245. In the Islamic context, at least, one of the basic challenges for religious studies is to show the contemporary relevance of the paradoxical position, man as slave of Allah, yet also his, but is also his Allah's vicegerent. As mentioned, nature is made tashkil already or malleable for him, yet he must not transgress the boundaries of what is good, halal, and harmful, haram, and what is just, adil, and, and just, zulum. These and other values are all part of Makasid al-Shari'ah, the beneficial objectives of the Sharia or regulations prescribed by revelation. The halalness or haramness of a thing or act is actually explicable from the components and processes of nature or society and societal life studied through the natural and human sciences. As such, the ethics underlying sustainable development need to be explained through both science and religion with philosophy providing tools for connecting the two and articulating the arguments and principles arising out of their harmonization. This exercise of explaining revelation by using scientific facts is also called theology of nature by some scholars, and it can be a part of the new philosophy of science for a sustainable planet. And, and it is actually a kind of dialogue between science and religion. In using resources, in treating the environment in ways that ensure balance, peace, and sustainability, humans enslave themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to feel, fulfill his commands and ordinances as debtors, as a somber uh, religious language describes it, to fulfill their guardianship of nature. God has created the environment, and nature, and the universe not only to enable us to know him, but also to enable humans to do good works, which in itself is a form of submission. And in submitting, humanity intrinsically becomes environmentally ethical, being best in conduct. So this enslavement, through this enslavement, which means being ethical and respectful of nature's ways, Humans operation, operationalize their God-given powers judiciously and eventually go on to build cities. Through guardianship, therefore, humanity attains to great heights of civilizational achievement. And he it is who created the heavens and the earth, and his throne was upon the water that he might try you, which of you is best in conduct. We have placed all that is in the earth as an ornament thereof, that we may try them, which of them is best in conduct. The first one, uh, Surah Hud, ayat 7. The second ayat uh, from Al-Kahfi, ayat uh, 7. Perhaps we should touch just a little bit on the idea of Hilafah. Lynn White Jr., a Christian scholar or Western scholar, once wrote that it was the concept of the vicegerency or the stewardship of humanity in the Christian and by implication in, in the minds of many people, possibly the Islamic too, uh, worldview that was responsible for the anthropocentric attitude to nature that gave rise to the environmental crisis. In the Islamic tradition, as mentioned earlier, nature has indeed been made malleable for humanity. See you not, Allah has made serviceable unto you whatsoever is in the skies and whatsoever is in the earth and has loaded you with his favors both without and within. Yet of mankind is he who disputes concerning Allah without knowledge or guidance or a scripture giving light. Surah Luqman, ayat 20. Has thou not seen how Allah has made all that is in the earth subservient unto you, and the ship runneth upon the sea by his command, and he holdeth back the heaven from falling on the earth unless by his leave. Allah is for mankind full of pity, full, uh, full of mercy. Al-Hajj, ayat 65. So despite this power that humanity is, has been given by Allah, Humanity is not to transgress boundaries, as explained by the science of ecology, nor to abuse nature, hence. Therefore, White's claim would be contested by Muslims. And to behave in an ethical manner towards the environment is, in a sense, what guardianship means. 
In the Islamic perspective, it means that humans are fulfilling the purpose of the existence, which is to serve the Creator. In so doing, they achieve happiness as they are naturally inclined to do. And this natural inclination connected to his natural human habits, dispositions, customs, ethics, or deen is also called fitra, the pattern of God's way, or sunnatullah, of creating things. This way is indeed what is meant by the sharia of Allah. Behaving in accordance with fitra and sharia results in harmony. It is the realization of what is actually intrinsically in one's true nature. And sharia is cosmos, or order as opposed to chaos, justice as opposed to injustice, Justice exists when something is where it belongs, as we mentioned earlier. Could sustainable development ultimately mean then that humans will discover their true states and beings as well as nature's true state and being, and that humans will live in accordance with this knowledge? I know as I speak, some people are already saying, oh, she's being taksuk to sustainable development. So I hope we will not do that. I'm just trying to interpret uh, what the current thinking about sustainable development, what what. The ideal meaning of sustainable development should be or could be for, for Muslims. So again, the poet philosopher Muhammad Iqbal said that in his studying of nature, the scientist is actually in a state of contemplation and worship. In this regard, we are reminded of the Quranic verses that speak of all creatures as glorifying Allah in their own ways, according to their own natures. Interpreters have taken the latter to be the creature's spiritual acts of glorifying, tasbih, praising, tahmid, prostrating, sujud, and praying salah to Allah. As such, before environmental ethics can be clearly expounded, ecological knowledge needs to be grasped through scientific observation and exercise emphasized by the Quran. Observing nature to understand creation and hence the revelation of Allah is an exercise called, as mentioned earlier, uh, some scholars call it a theology of nature. The understanding of revelation using scientific knowledge. God has created the seven heavens in harmony. Thou canst see no faults in the beneficent one's creation. Then look again. Can thou see any rifts? 33 uh, Al-Muluk, ayat number 3. This is also part of the meaning of submission or Islam. Submission does not mean the loss of freedom, but in fact, it is the means to attain freedom, to live according to the demands of one's true nature, to be at one with life, which in the human context has no end. And it encompasses the seen, the zahir, and the unseen, the batin. In this way, Allah has created all things to distinguish truth from falsehood, right from wrong, and to set out a clear ethics. The realization of which can be seen in our context today as interpretable and it reminds us of the ayat as sustainable development may remind us. And we created not the heavens and the earth and all that is between them in play, we created them not safe with truth, but most of them know not. Adukan ayat 38 to 39. I think I will stop there, uh, Professor Tamim. Uh, if there are... Uh, uh, colleagues out there, one or two of them, who are interested in these drafts of, um, of, of a paper, uh, they can email us and we are very happy to share. But uh, today I, I present you some of these thoughts, uh, which I thought after listening to Professor uh, Tansri Zul, and uh, I thought it, it is not unlinkable to what he was saying. Uh, Wabillahi Taufiq wa Hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Professor Aziza binti Baharuddin, for your speech. Alhamdulillah, you have talked about the Islamic perspective of uh, the science, particularly the arguments related to ecology and environmental ethics. Uh, we also will be very grateful to you if you could give us the updated paper, uh, yeah. and uh, Istak will publish it as a monograph, inshallah. This is inshallah. our plan. The speeches and the talks of our respected guests of honor to give us the papers, and we will publish it, inshallah. Okay. I will write to you, and uh, maybe you can take another one or two or three months to improve uh, the content and the argument. And there are probably questions from the floor, which you may want to address in your paper. And finally, we will, inshallah, publish it. So with this, uh, uh, we move on to the next uh, panelist, Professor Dato, Engineer Dr. Wan Ramli Wan Daud. 
Professor Dato, Dr. Wan, Dembley, Wan Ramli Wan Daoud is the UKM Petronas Chair of Sustainable Hydrogen Energy at the Fuel Cell Institute, University of Kabangsan, Malaysia from December 2019 to 21. He is also a professor of chemical engineering at Department of Chemical and Process Engineering, Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, University of Kabangsan, Malaysia and Principal Research Fellow at the Fuel Cell Institute, UKM. He is the founding director of the Fuel Cell Institute, UKM, and the founding president of the Malaysian Association of Hydrogen Energy, 2018 to 2021. He was elected fellow of Institution of Chemical Engineers in 2007, and was chairman of its Malaysia branch in 2009. He was elected a fellow of the Academy of Science Malaysia, Malaysia's institution for top scientists in 2012 for his world leading role in scientific work on hydrogen energy and fuel cells. He received the prestigious Merdeka Award 2016 for outstanding scholastic achievement, which is Malaysia's top award for Malaysian scientists on 23rd September 2016 for outstanding scholarly research and development work in advancing the technology of fuel cells and hydrogen energy in Malaysia, the region and the world. He was also listed as one of the world's most influential scientific minds in the top 1% of the world scientists and highly cited researcher in engineering six times in 2015 and 2016 by Thomas Reuters, 2017, 18, 19 and 20 by Clarivate analytics for the higher for the highest number of highly cited papers. He promoted the hydrogen economy by spearheading the development of the first Malaysian roadmap for solar energy, hydrogen energy, and fuel cells in fuel cells in 2006. He updated the hydrogen and fuel cells roadmap in the blueprint of fuel cells industry in Malaysia, published by ASM in 2017. He also wrote a position paper on the hydrogen economy in Malaysia for ASM to be presented to the Malaysian government in 2020. He published 410 articles in international journals, 400 articles in proceedings of international conferences, and 235 articles in proceedings of national conferences. He is cited in WOS, formerly WOS as ISI, 9,545 times with high index 51 in Scopus, 10,579 times with high index 53 and in Google Scholar 16,027 times with high index 64. He was invited to present 21 keynote and 10 invited papers on hydrogen energy and fuel cells in China, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Iran, Japan, Malaysia, Netherlands, Philippines, Russia, Singapore, and Thailand. With this brief introduction, may I respectfully call upon Dr. Professor Dr. Juan Ramli to deliver his speech. For let the further help start. Can you unmute, Doctor? Can you unmute? I think you are muted. Prof, you are muted. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sorry. Sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Uh, Tamim yeah, for uh, introducing me uh, and also from, uh, for uh, Professor Dato Usman Baka for uh, inviting me to the webinar and uh, Tan Sri Zoh, um, and also Dato Azizan. Yeah. Um, Today I'm I'm going to talk about um, the need for a new um, philosophy of technology. So I would like to share my um, presentation. Can I? Yes. Now. Most welcome, Dr. Prof. Yes. yes. Uh, okay, can you see it? Yes, we can see. Yes, that's all we can see. So I will 
talk about um, philosophy terminology for sustainable planet Earth. So um, in in the uh, paper, I, I would like to talk about what is technology and a short review of Western philosophy of technology, and also some uh, a review of various schools of contemporary Islamic philosophy of science, yeah, that uh, has been developed for the past 20 years. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I would like to venture into um, defining what Islamic technology is and what Islamic philosophy of technology would be, and how this is um, connected to um, what kind of technology should we uh, support or should we implement or, or develop, yeah? So question of technology selection, yeah? And, and um, in order to answer the technology selection, we'll look at um, what Islam uh, talk about um, exploitation of natural resources, and, and ecology, yeah? And then, of course, it, this would also involve uh, ethics. So we'll have a short discussion of Western and, and Islamic ethics. And then um, the role of, of man as keeper of universe and the creatures. And then some um, uh, technology uh, that uh, was selected using some of this uh, criteria. And uh, incidentally, all this technology uh, is, is the one that I developed in my scientific career, uh, low carbon energy technology uh, for an energy transformation or transition from fossil energy to renewable electric hydrogen energy. And then we'll talk about um, hydrogen economy and also uh, what would be be like for Malaysia to embark on the hydrogen economy? Yeah, so there will be a, a discussion on the roadmap, uh, which is which I propose uh, to the government uh, for the next uh, trade Malaysia plan. Right, what is technology? So if you look at um, historians of technology, like, like Singer, technology is defined as artifact to meet the needs of man and the method of making them. Tools or machine, uh, excluding tool-less and machine-less techniques, giving rise to notion of neutral neutrality of technology. So um, to them, uh, there is no value or, or, or it's neutral, eh? technology is neutral. And if you look at others like uh, procedures of or rules to achieve practical ends, yeah? techniques including other than tools and machine. Um, if you look at a uh, more uh, recent uh, um, definition, yeah? uh, technology as applied science, yeah? where scientific discoveries are used to develop technology. Yeah? A more modern definition of technology as an ecosystem, yeah? application of scientific or other knowledge to practical tasks by ordered systems that involve people and organizations, productive skill, uh, living things, and machines. Yeah? Uh, this is uh, uh, defined by Pesi, uh, a historian of technology at MIT. Technological ecosystem that give rise to notion of value-laden technology. So uh, the notion of technology has evolved from a neutral definition of technology of uh, Singer to uh, a more loaded or value-laden technology um, defined by Pesi. Um, right, so let's just look at what has developed the philosophy of technology. Philosophy of technology is quite new. Um, uh, compared to philosophy of science um, and um, um, classical Western philosophy of technology arose in the 1920s, yeah? 1920s, so not so long ago. Yeah? Due to concern on overwhelming role of technology 
played in modern life and its destructive effects on society and environment in wars. Yeah? This was the period of the Great War. And criticism against Enlightenment instrumentalist view of technology yeah? as, a, uh, as a neutral, yeah? which um, um, and could be controlled by man to satisfy his needs. Yeah, this is a, a Baconian, Baconian uh, view of, of uh, technology yeah? as an instrument. Uh, um, and then uh, we, we have the determinist, yeah? determinism. Most social scientists since Marx hold that technology cannot be controlled because it controls man by shaping human life. Yeah? And... Um, <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Um, Ilal, or Ilul, yeah, he's a, a French uh, uh, historian of technology, saw technology as an uncontrollable autonomous force, yeah? that build society and political institution according to its own logic to determine the path humanity should take. So um, technology controls man, yeah? And then uh, Heidegger, Heidegger tried to uh, determine what, what is actually technology, substance of technology. So his approach is called substantivism of Heidegger, um, held that uncontrollable technology has inframed eh, our entire way of thinking yeah, and feeling such that the world cannot be known by other means and had turned mankind and the world into standing reserves or commodities only to be used. And then there is the critical theory yeah, of technology. This was uh, in the 60s yeah, uh, by Marcusi and Habermas. Um, it holds that although um, um, <clears throat> instrumentalism, as instrumentalism has caused widespread environmental damage and the rise of totalitarianism, technology can still be controlled by more democratic means. Yeah? Now, what are the problems of classical philosophy of technology? It depicts technology negatively and pessimistically, but contemporary of technology be have become more ambivalent on whether technology is bad or good. Um, classical philosophy of technology holds that technology is unstoppable and autonomous, but recent science and technology studies, STS, show that technology is contingent and can be socially constructed. Definition of technology is also too general and vague. Little attention given to differences in technologies and to how each technology is developed. By the late 80s and 90s, philosophy of technology became more society oriented. Yeah? Um, emerging empirical science and technology studies yeah? on development of actual technologies, which is known as the empirical turn. Yeah? of the philosophy of technology. Pragmatism and post-structuralism led by Hickman and Latour uh, that believed technology could be developed in a more ethical, socially acceptable and democratic way. And lastly, um, the emergence of engineering oriented school of philosophy of technology led by Kroes, yeah, uh, where philosophy of technology is based on engineering practice and product. So um, this latest one, the engineering oriented philosophy of technology, uh, looks at engineering yeah, as a, a knowledge. Yeah? So, and uh, the main aim of engineering knowledge is to create a shape configuration of artifact yeah, to enable it to function according to what we call the operating principle of the artifact. And to achieve that, um, um, this uh, school developed the engineering method, yeah, 
just like the scientific method, there's also the engineering method, a way of obtain, obtaining practical knowledge by selecting or creating uh, design, yeah? uh, what we call the synthesis stage, based on inspiration, intuition, and heuristics, uh, and testing the prototype or simulating it using mathematical model, uh, the analysis. And the behavior of both engineering system and engineering devices depends on both uh, the laws of science and design and configuration. Yeah? So it's not just uh, the application of science, but there is another uh, component of it, which is the design and configuration. And that would uh, result in the operating principle of the, of the um, artifact. So, and I put there some uh, definition of what invention, design, innovation, creativity, uh, and so on, yeah. Um, and uh, another new independent development is the emergence of engineering ethics uh, in, in the form of professional code of ethics and the use of applied ethics in the study of ethical, uh, uh, ethical implications of technology. Um, I speak also a, a brief uh, typology of Islamic philosophy of science, yeah? Um, contemporary one, yeah? Trivial school, uh, Bukhelism, named after its founder, Bukhel, yeah? Uh, tries to prove the truth of Al Quran by equating certain verses with scientific discoveries of Western science, neglects the relativism and provisional nature of scientific theories in comparison with the absolute and eternal nature of Al Quran. And then you have the what I call the traditionalist school of Syed Hussein Nasser that regards past Muslim scientists um, uh, and uh, using the Tawhidic principle of oneness of God as basis for integration of the natural world. Yeah? Um, I'm sure uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Osman would be more uh, competent in, uh, um, in uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the thoughts of Cyrus in Nassau. Yeah? And um, also, another traditional uh, school is the school of Said Hussein, Said, sorry, Said Najib al -Tas. Um, And then the legal, legalistic school of fiqh of Ismail Afaruki, yeah, uses categories of fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence. And its new version is the use of Maqasid al-Sharia, yeah, Maqasid al-Sharia. And then there is the Ismaili school, led by Zeldin Sada, yeah. Uh, he's not interested in the substance of science, but more on the uh, governance of science and using Islamic ethical values, just as Adel and Zulu, yeah. And the latest or new version is integration of knowledge, yeah, based on Western educational crisis, yeah. And then, of course, the Aliga School of uh, um, Islamic Science, um, this school have, have uh, stopped publishing, so I'm not sure where they, they have gone to. Um, and then there's the um, Islamic Academy of Science Malaysia, yeah, whose proponent were Professor Dr. Osman himself, Prof. Shari and myself. And uh, uh, one of the uh, things that we do is to criticize Western science and to reveal its weakness and incompatibility with Islam, and to offer a more compatible alternative theory. Yeah? Uh, Prof. Dr. Osman himself has criticized the theory of evolution, Prof. Shahri, uh, quantum physics and relativity, myself on technology. Yeah? Um, and uh, uh, after 1998, uh, we, the Academy of Science Malaysia sorry, the Islamic Academy of Science, Malaysia, Asasi, um, um, <clears throat> expanded our research from Islamization of knowledge to indigenization knowledge, which includes uh, Malay uh, science, 
before the coming of Islam. And uh, we also studied what we call Malay ethno science and ethno technology. And Prosheri found that, discovered that um, the Malays probably developed the zero and the decimal number um, at least uh, two or three centuries earlier than the Indians and probably four centuries earlier than the Arabs. Yeah, this, um, the evidence is cast in stone. Yeah, um, several stone inscription uh, shows the use of the zero and the uh, decimal system yeah? in, uh, six, uh, in the seventh century. Yeah? And then uh, also, uh, we have also people in the Academy of Science, uh, sorry, the Islamic Academy of Science, uh, studying classical Islamic science to unearth new understanding of science that could be revived into a new Islamic science. For example, looking at Fakul Razi, Al Surawardi, or even uh, Jabir bin Hayyan, and so on, yeah, for a new theory. Okay. What is Islamic technology? Um, practical knowledge and artifact to meet the needs of the uh, the needs of the Ummah. Yeah? Um, and um, I I have developed some uh, ideas about um, Islamic technology. Yeah, governed by divine law implemented in accordance with the Islamic ethics that emphasizes justice and equitability, always in a state of balance and equilibrium with the universe and undertaken responsibly and sustainably by man as the representative of God on earth. And um, um, if, if you look closely at this definition, it's a, it's a teleological understanding of technology. And this is similar to the understanding of the Greeks, yeah? Because it's derived from Greek concept of poiesis and technique, yeah? Uh, because um, the Muslim heartlands, yeah, are also um, um, inherits the uh, Hellenistic uh, heritage, yeah? Um, in in uh, Egypt and Syria and Iraq. So poiesis is the making or bringing into existence of an artifact from an idea. Yeah, which also has a purpose, while technique is the knowledge of making an artifact for a specific purpose. Uh, that's a teleological definition of technology. Yeah. And um, so, te so technology is the responsible and equitable use of natural resources that are made available by God for men to use uh, using concept of tashir and tazlil. Uh, in the Quran and to meet his needs, yeah? to make uh, artifacts to meet his needs, uh, to satisfy yeah, the maqasid al-shari'ah. Yeah? And uh, technology used by man as Allah's representative on earth, yeah, Khalifa Fi'ar, in a fair and equitable manner, both to man and the environment, yeah? based on Islamic ethics. A Western historian, uh, White, yeah, Lynn White, criticized this view uh, as being too anthropocentric, yeah? granting mankind absolute right to master the creatures and the universe. This is probably true in Christianity, yeah? especially according to Western tradition of religion. But as I've shown uh, in the Quran itself, um, Allah has given men as the Khalifa to uh use the um resources yeah uh, because allah has already subjected them for men to use now which technology so this is a crucial uh uh question that uh ask yeah for technologies yeah so um most technology in the past that emerged through curiosity, aesthetics, yeah, and uh, societal needs 
were inspired by individual or communal inventors and um, were uh, not de 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 um, uh, developed by governments nor by companies. Yeah? Only technology whose potential use in warfare or West generation were developed by government and companies. Yeah? And you can see that after the Second World War, after the successful invention of the atomic bomb, the uh, selection of technology has become an important agenda of government and company laboratories yeah? in search of more powerful weapons and more commercial product. Um, and history of technology has shown that technology which was selected only for uh, profitability and or national security and not on the basis of higher values had uh, contributed to the destruction of the environment and had threatened uh, human life on a major scale. Uh, fortunately, clear evidence of global warming caused by greenhouse gas emission and its effect on climate change have convinced the conscience of many governments and companies to urgent, uh, the urgency of abandoning greenhouse gas em emitted technology. Yeah? So, um, and mankind always wait for a disaster to happen before you decide to, to change. And this is what happened. Yeah? Uh, the carbon emission has been going on for a long time and um, global temperatures has risen. And uh, uh, lately we have um, um, intense uh, climate change um, uh, events, yeah? uh, for example, um, um, more hurricanes, more tornadoes, and, and, and so on. Yeah? Um, so there is an urgent need to develop method of technology selection based on higher values, such, as, such that future technologies will be safer and cleaner. All right. Um, in terms of uh, Islam, yeah, uh, economic development involves industrialization, yeah, uh, which is the use of natural and human resources and manufacturing technology to produce products and services on a large scale competitively. In Islam, the use of natural resources is termed tasqir and tasqir, which means the subjugation of natural resources for human benefit. It's not absolute, unconditional subjugation to allow mankind to exploit natural resources with impunity as in capitalism. Yeah? Allah, the owner, proprietor of the entire universe has subjected all natural resources for use by mankind. And mankind as caliph or successor to Allah on earth who uses the natural resources subjugated for him on earth responsibly within the bounds of the Sharia and Islamic asset. So it's not enough um, the Sharia, but there's there's also uh, ethics as well because um, there is always uh, uh, a difference yeah, between uh, ethical actions and uh, Sharia compliant action. Yeah? It could be Sharia compliant but not ethical, right? It could be ethical but not Sharia compliant. Yeah. So the Sharia is not only the set of religious and criminal laws such as Hudud and Hizos, but it's a dynamic legal system that could solve the problems of modern life brought about by technological change. <clears throat> uh, utilization of uh, resources in Islam is Tazkir or Tazril, which means Allah's, Allah's subjection of natural resources for the benefits of men to be used within the limits of divine law and Islamic ethical system. And uh, the Islamic understanding of ecology is based on uh, understanding of Tawheed, Allah is the creator, owner, and guardian of the universe and creatures, and the sacred nature of creatures who are always praising Allah and who have their own ummah, yeah, ummah or communities, yeah, 
uh, the word umat was uh, is used in uh, surah al anam yeah so creatures have their own umat or communities not just men uh, allah creates the umat communities of creatures and the universe in harmony and balance with one another so the ecosystem is network of various creatures umat or, or communities in equilibrium with the sacred universe praising allah and become ayat or signs of allah mankind and living creatures are created from the same material water and because of it they share the same physical fate in the world earth is sacred because dust from it is clean and sacred and can be used for tayammum yeah and its surface can be used for prayers yeah? um next since engineering and technological artifacts impact directly on the environment and ecological system islamic understanding of ecology must uh, be <clears throat> uh, understood before understanding how artifacts are invented invented since the continuous praising of allah by the creatures maintains the balance and equilibrium in the universe their destruction which is uh, in the quran is fasad fil ard by uh, technology by man uh, as a result of technology use would destroy this balance and equilibrium this destruction causes apocalyptic natural disaster uh, which is a loss punishment of the zalim mankind yeah that uh, commit the fasad fuel out um since the creation of mankind is dwarfed by the huge expanse of the great and the great varieties of creatures uh, and the huge expanse of the universe mankind should uh, realize his own insignificant position compared to all the creatures and the universe and be in awe of them and should avoid from destroying them apart from understanding of the ecology technology selection should also be based on the ethics of the community inventing and using the technology in early western ethics virtue ethics of aristotle purpose of ethical action um <coughs> is <coughs> sorry i couldn't see the uh, yeah of the community sorry uh virtue ethics of aristotle the purpose of ethical action is happiness and only a virtuous man can act rightly to produce a good yeah virtues or golden mean dispositions such as the four cardinal virtues of wisdom yeah um, courage temperance and justice are the middle between two extreme disposition one of excess and the other of deficiency after the enlightenment virtue ethic was replaced by Uh, at least three humanist and rationalist philosophy of ethics yeah duty ethics of kant right ethics of locke and utility ethics of mill kant's duty ethics ethical action fulfills a duty owed to human being who deserve the honor and respect as an independent moral agent which is mandatory and absolute because it could be proven to be universal as a good right ethics of law suggested that ethical action protects human rights because man has absolute right to life liberty and property ownership but uh, as we know the poor and needy people who should have the greater need for help by ethical action just but not uh, only people who have property yeah utilitarian ethics of mill and ethical action brings greater benefit for the most number of people but the wishes of the many are not always right islamic ethics islamic theory of ethics of al ghazali and ibn maskawi is applied in the study of ethical ethical implications of technology and in the selection of appropriate technology for the muslim world in islamic ethics the aim of a good yeah um, and variously Uh, albir hasanat and ain khairat there are some semantic differences in meaning of all these words um 
all right action, al-amal as-saliha, is not only rewarded with worldly happiness, but happiness, uh, sa'adah, in the hereafter too, yeah? in the Islamic uh, view of ethics. Al-bil, al-hasanat, or al-khairat, a good will not be achieved by only worshipping, but by, by being just and equitable, not just by uh, doing the salat and zakat and uh, so on, but also by being just and equitable, yeah, adil and kiss, yeah. For Ibn Maskaway and Al Ghazali, constituents of virtue are wisdom, al hikmah, courage, al shaja'a, and moderation, al infa, which, when combined, produce the highest virtue, justice, al adala. Happiness, as saada, the ultimate goal of virtuous man is happiness in this world and the hereafter, which is compatible with Islamic understanding regarding the recompense of reward in the hereafter for right action in the world and prayers for goodness of hasanat in the world and in the hereafter. So, man as keeper of universe and creatures, yeah? Subjugation and use of natural resources in engineering through the proper process of tazkir or tazlil by mankind as Allah successor on earth is conducted within the limits of the sharia or law and is just and equitable to all people according to Islamic ethics that emphasizes justice. Yeah? Engineers involved in proper tazkir and tazlil uh, right, should have appropriate moral virtues such as justice, honesty, trust, and integrity by cultivating the spiritual self through the inculcation of adab or good manners, tadi, education, terbiah, or self-purification, that's kia, aimed at producing the perfect man, the perfect human being who has all the virtues and able to act justly and equitably among mankind. Conventional energy technologies, which is uh, within the field of my scientific study, using fossil fuels, have polluted the earth by emission of air pollutant gases such as sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide, warm the globe by emission of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, and cause climate change. Yeah? Air pollution and climate change caused by fossil fuel is a facade fuel R. And by understanding technology, technology and ecosystem from an Islamic perspective, the use of fossil fuel should be reduced or stopped altogether and complemented or replaced with renewable energy generated from renewable natural resources such as solar energy, wind energy, biomass and hydro, and zero emission alternative energy such as hydrogen, energy. Measures to reduce or eliminate use of fossil fuel and replace it with clean, low carbon, renewable and alternative energy is an ethically right action because it leads to the good of sustainable human life on earth. It is a just and equitable action, not only for mankind, but also for ummah of creatures that inhabit earth clean, no carbon technology such as solar, wind, and hydro energy are good by themselves. Yeah? Al-Bir, Al-Hasanat, or Al-Khairat, because they are renewable yeah, by solar radiation without emitting air pollutants or greenhouse gases and won't cause uh, global warming or climate change. Similarly, renewable biomass energy is a good by itself because Greenhouse gas emitted from burning biomass is recycled naturally in the process of photosynthesis by, um, by trees for renewable of for renewal of biomass. Hydrogen energy that produces water only from energy conversion to electrical or thermal energy is also a good by itself because of the zero emission of greenhouse gases, especially when hydrogen energy is completely renewable in the future once the limitations of solar photoelectrochemical water splitting technology is solved. And 
the transition or transformation is from fossil energy on the left, and you can see there's a lot of red lines. Those are the uh, oil yeah, being used in a lot of transportation and electricity generation. Um, but and to be transformed into the one on the right, yeah, um, which um, replace most of the uh, uh, fossil fuel for transportation and electrical, electrical generation using um, renewable energy, wind and solar, and hydrogen energy. And you can see the blue flame, the light blue flame, that's the uh, hydrogen uh, energy. Yeah? And um, so when you transform to the one on the right, you reduce the emission of greenhouse gas emission, like, sorry, greenhouse gases, yeah, that causes climate change. Yeah? And um, this is what um, hydrogen energy is. It's like a circular economy, yeah, where you don't produce any waste or greenhouse gases yeah, to um, warm or cause climate change. And for Malaysia, I have suggested uh, the following roadmap. Yeah, in the short term, um, there should be um, more public awareness campaign on the uh, transition to a hydrogen economy and development of policies and guidelines to support new and novel fuel cell application, and also development of codes and standard for hydrogen safety yeah, and policies to support hydrogen infrastructure. For the medium term, <coughs> is to develop supply chain of fuel cell component, conventional, sorry, convenient market entry of hydrogen and fuel cell application, and some uh, demo project for hydrogen uh, transportation and uh, standalone power, yeah, and also uh, power banks from uh, methanol fuel cell. And in the medium term, uh, uh, fuel so, cell uh, cost reduction uh, and so on. Did you respond to that? Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, and uh, the thought, last, please. Last slide. Okay, okay. So thank you, thank you. I, so you can see that um, by effectively using uh, Islamic philosophy of science, we could, sorry, of technology, we could uh, decide which uh, energy technology to use. And so thank you very much. Shukran. Terima kasih. Thank you, Chair Shah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dato Wan Ramli Wan Daud, for your presentation uh, on the philosophy of science from the Islamic perspective. You have uh, uh, quoted a number of uh, ayat of the Quran uh, in your uh, discussion. I myself have two questions, inshallah. I will reserve those questions at the end. With this, uh, we move on to the next panelist, who is none other than Professor Dr. Ahmed Hafiz Zulkifli, Deputy Rector for Responsible Research and Innovation. Apart from holding this position, he also holds other positions in the university. He is currently the director of IIUM Medical Specialist Center. He is also a consultant, anthroplasty and orthopedic surgeon in the Department of Orthopedics, Traumatology and Rehabilitation, Kulia of Medicine, International Islamic University, Malaysia. He's also uh, a lab director, Advanced Orthopedic Research Laboratory, IIUM. He has been a member of uh, a good number of uh, professional bodies, such as Islamic Medical Association of Malaysia, Malaysia Orthopedic Association, Asia Pacific Diabetic Limb Problem Association, Academy of Medicine Malaysia, Asia Pacific Diabetic Limb Problem Association, and so on. His research interests include diabetic food research, orthopedics, joint replacement and clinical trial, metal injection molding plates for orthopedics application and 
many other areas. He has authored a book titled Metal Injection, Molding of Implant Materials. And he has uh, several book chapters and uh, articles to his credit. Due to uh, time constraint, I'm not able to read his impressive biodata. With this, may I respectfully call upon Professor Dr. Ahmed Hafiz Zulkulvi to deliver his presentation. Fali atafadal, mashkuran ya sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Tamin, to all uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I think you can see my, I shared. The, yes. Yeah, okay. You can see, Prof. Sparwai. Okay, um, So, as been explained by the previous three speakers about the philosophy of the uh, uh, science of sustainable planet Earth, now it's for me to actually make it a bit simple. Uh, sustainable development is not a new concept to Muslim. The Quran and Hadith provide framework for the spiritual and physical welfare of humanity. There are over 500 verses in the Quran giving Muslim guidance on matters relating to the environment and how to deal with it. And there are numerous examples of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his saying, uh, which provide a model for justice and equality According to Abu Runya, sustainable development from Islamic sake uh, to establish a balance between the environment, economic, and social dimensions also have been mentioned by the first speaker. It means that it balance the consumer welfare, the economic efficiency, achievements, or ecological balance in the framework of evolutionary knowledge-based and socially interactive model defining the social justice, shurotic process, charity, and zakah are two mechanisms to reduce poverty. In Islam, the purpose of nature is for man to study nature in order to discover God and to use nature for the benefit of mankind. Nature can be used uh, to provide food for mankind and its bounty is to be equally distributed among all people. All activities that cause harm to mankind and in turn destroy nature are forbidden. Destructions of natural balance is discouraged. For example, unnecessary killing of animals or renewal of vegetations may in turn lead to starvation due to lack of food. This is in view of extensions of idea of that man has placed on earth as God, God's representative, as mentioned by Faruqi, Zaidi, and so. The Quranic doctrine of Vice or Khalifa placed man in the role of Amana and or trustee and custodians of the earth thus responsible for the building the earth and utilizing its resources with sense of justice to oneness and to fellow mankind. 
the role assigned to men by Quran include accountability of the numerous resources given by God or Allah. Moreover, the Islamic concept of knowledge includes both the transcendental knowledge as well as knowledge based on sense perceptions and observation. Consequently, all kind, all, all knowledge uh, gained through scientific activities aims to result in human welfare and seeks it, uh, to utilize the resources of the universe for the benefit, beneficial purpose. Earth is mentioned 61 times in the Quran. According to Islam, the universe has been created by Allah with a specific purpose and for a limited time. The utilizations of all natural resources are considered the right and the joint property of entire humankind. Areas to be utilized according to Sharaf principle were all this about rain, land commendation, wildlife, water, environment, peace, and uh, public participation is more uh, welcome. According to Spang uh, Jember, science for sustainability is an attempt to strengthen the dialogue between society and science, as mentioned earlier by our speaker earlier. An attempt, uh, it supports the search, for process, uh, search process for sustainable solution, help assess the impact of current decision and identify the actions required for the future environment to reach a certain state. Mostly science help humans to be uh, more easy in life. Based on the uh, Science for Future Sustainability, based on the UNESCO, by linking science to society, public understanding of science and the particip uh, participations of citizens in science are essential to creating societies where people have the necessary knowledge to make, profession, to make professional, personal and political choices and to participate in the stimulating world of discovery. Indigenous knowledge uh, systems, knowledge uh, developed with long and close interactions with nature complement knowledge systems based on modern science. So role of sciences for future sustainability is to provide information to better enab enable formulations and selections of environment and development policies in decision-making process, to provide better understanding of land, ocean, atmosphere, water, nutrient, and other part of the earth system. Then it, to provide continuous improvements in efficiency of resource utilizations. Role of science uh, also by implementing transdisciplinary research activities. The uh, scientific knowledge can be shared through scientific studies of national and regional pathway to sustainable development. By carrying out research programs in order better to understand the carrying capacity of the earth as conditioned by its natural system. If we, let's say we look at the SDG in Malaysia, based on the SDG 6, 7, 12, 13, 14, 15, which are currently pursuing green growth for sustainability and resilience and related to one of the RNK 12 dimension. Uh, the concept of kemampuan alam sekitar, dimensi kemampanan alam sekitar, which took over the blue economy, the green technology, and renewable energy adaptations and mitigations of uh, environments. The environmental uh, sustainability dimension, among others, include the blue economy, green technology, and renewable energy, as well as adaptations and mitigation of climate change. Even in, in our country for 2030, the uh, sustainable or shared prosperity policy have about 14 ideas how 
to continue the development uh, goals in the country or they to sustain the earth. Even yesterday, during the Hari Perhutanan Antarabangsa, the, the Forest Day, uh, International Forest Day, and we already have this, what they call Dasa Perhutanan Malaysia. We already have at least the basic thing to actually go green. And the only thing that is that whether our education, our system of uh, in the university have this philosophy of science towards sustainable planet Earth is another question. Whether the philosophy is going to be another topic in the uh, university so that everybody who comes across the university will get this knowledge of philosophy wherever that have been discussed by Prof. Uh, Tan Sri Zul, Prof. Dato Azizan and Prof. Wan Ramdi just now can be taught to them. And with that, I think uh, our future is good. Only thing is that whether we are brave enough to bring back philosophy in our education system. So as a conclusion, there must be good interaction between man and the environment for sustainability of earth. This can be done by education and by having this philosophy incul uh, inculcate the uh, in the university or even during their uh, primary and secondary school. As Muslim, Al-Quran and Al-Hadith as the main references and integral part of Islamic beliefs for the environmental awareness and protections of natural resources. With that, I think, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Tamin. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ahmed Hafiz for your uh, uh, discussion, which is another uh, added uh, dimension to our topic of uh, uh, sustainability of Earth from the Islamic perspective. Now, our uh, last speaker is none other than uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Uthman Bakr. Professor Dr. Uthman Bakr, uh, a doctorate in Islamic philosophy from Temple University, Philadelphia, is currently a holder of Al-Ghazali Chair of Epistemology and Civilizational Studies and Renewal at ISTEC IIUM. He is also a emeritus professor in philosophy of science at University of Malaya. He was formerly distinguished professor and director of Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin Center for Islamic Studies, University Brunei Darussalam. Professor Usman was also formerly Malaysia Chair of Islam in Southeast Asia at the Prince Talal Al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding Georgetown University, Washington, DC, and Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and Research at University of Malaya. Dr. Usman is the author and editor of 40 books and more than 300 articles on various aspects of Islamic thought and civilization, particularly Islamic science and philosophy, in which he is a leading authority. His most well-known books are Classification of Knowledge in Islam, Tawheed and Science. His latest books are Al-Farabi, Life, Works and Significance, Colonialism in the Malay Archipelago, Civilizational Encounters, published in 2020 by ISTEC IIM Publications. He has been named among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world since 2000. Nine. He was made a Dato in 1994 by the Sultan of Pahang and a Dato by the King in 2000. With this brief introduction, may I respectfully call upon Dato Professor Dr. Usman Bakar to deliver his speech. Faleta Fadali Austad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala asrafil anbiya'i wa salin. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi 
wasabi ajmain assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, very good uh, uh, morning of the afternoon now uh, well uh, i think all the previous speakers have uh, together they have covered a very vast area uh, covering issues many many issues related to the uh, subject of uh, philosophy of science even philosophy of uh, technology what i intend to to do uh, is to just address what i consider as the the core issues uh, that are implied by the topic of the webinar. Let me begin by saying that more and more people today are aware of the precarious situation in which our planet Earth um, is trying to be and the word right now that is being used in order to describe this uh, uh, precarious situation is unsustainability of the planet. Yeah? That our planet is not uh, sustainable. And um, I think uh, precisely because of that awareness, uh, we have the United Nations as the peak of the attempts of, uh, of the global community to address this problem. Uh, we're coming up with uh, the 17th um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and uh, the world itself, of course, uh, is presented with the awareness that uh, development goals, development philosophy, development patterns in the past uh, could not be continued. Uh, could not be continued because precisely um, those practices in the past have landed us in, the, uh, in our current, uh, current situation. But uh, it is good that uh, we want to make as our goal, uh, we would like to see our planet Earth uh, sustainable, meaning that the sustainable is precisely that uh, in, in terms of that the it can sustain the needs the future needs of of humanity the question uh, whether uh, we will succeed or not i think that is open to question i mean it is an open discussion uh, we can have a high hope you know but uh, personally uh, I'm not quite optimistic uh, that the humanity uh, will be able to attain this goal unless, it's a very, very big unless, very big unless, that um, there's some changes from within man himself. In other words, the corrections to be made the the changes we made are not merely uh, external to the human condition, but something inside. Uh, this is something that uh, I'm uh, I'm not that uh, optimistic. Uh, the as I say, old habits die hard. Yeah? Old habits die hard. Um, but anyway, um, we hope for the best. Inshallah. But uh, let us address the issues because there are uh, very fundamental issues related to the to the, the state of affairs. Now, I I would like just to, to to talk about the ecological crisis because it was the ecological crisis that raises the issue of unsustainability of planet Earth in the first place. It was ecological crisis. So as long, in my view, in fact, I'm quite convinced that as long as the ecological crisis persists, then the issue of unsustainability of planet Earth will continue. So therefore, it is very important to address the, this question of the ecological crisis. Uh, much has been 
much progress has been made in this in this area gain greater awareness of the nature of the ecological crisis the extent of the crisis um but as usual the the problem is whether the countermeasures that we propose uh, will address this this is issue since you are talking about philosophy of science from the islamic perspective i would like to point out that well the ecological crisis that the, the first alarm the the, the, bell, the bell alarm was a, a race that was in the middle of the 1960s right so that was more than uh, 50 years ago yeah and the response to that has been slow has been slow now what are the roots of the ecological crisis i think that 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 has to be addressed. i don't think that has been fully addressed so for that reason i would like to take you back to, to refer to uh, the writings by said osen nasser the title man and nature the spiritual crisis of modern man in which it talks about the ecological crisis faced by humanity basically it is the uh, it is the crisis of uh, of the planet of the planet Earth. so i would advise that this book be read because although uh, more than 50 years ago you know uh, but this book still uh, com uh, uh, conveys a very very important message and it is addressed to the entire humanity and to cut it here to, to summarize uh, nasser discussed the historical roots of the crisis going back basically dealing with the history with the history of uh, scientific thought history of philosophy of science in western civilization pointing out that um, in the history of western thought uh, basically there was uh, the, the, the idea of science the idea of nature philosophy of nature uh, that is to be found in other traditions uh, it's not there or rather or rather uh, those dimensions within christianity that are uh, in a sense really very relevant Certain people uh, themselves. So there is, uh, you know, there was, it's, it's very, very important to understand that, um, for example, how theology itself was used in the West to justify aggression, domination of nature. Yeah, that, this important point. Now the other one is the philosophical roots of the crisis. Uh, this is, uh, in in a sense, uh, if I were to summarize this. Uh, what is meant what, by, by, by Nasser, the, the philosophical rules was that the conception of science itself, or rather, uh, philosophy has ceased to be a critic of science. Science itself uh, became the criteria of whether philosophy is correct or, is correct or not, which, was a, which is different from the case of Islamic uh, civilization. So, uh, and, and what we see was that uh, the what gained currency and ascendancy in well in modern Western thought were the various streams of philosophy of science that may be described. Some of them could be described as anti-religious, uh, as simply atheistic. Uh, in, in any way, in the sense that does not provide any place for religion in philosophy uh, of science. So that's, uh, that's the situation that, that, that we had. So what is needed? Uh, Nasser's answer to that question is, what is needed, what humanity needs is a spiritual vision of the planet Earth. Because there are now several visions. One vision of our planet Earth is, of course, has, uh, no, it's, it is, um, uh, it's not religious, it excludes that. It's in purely, uh, purely uh, scientific in the very, very narrow sense. But we also need a spiritual vision of man's position and role on the planet. 
what is actually the position and role of men on the planet? We, we, earlier, we, we, we heard Professor Hafiz, for example, refer uh, to the, the, the concept of uh, God's vicegerent, uh, Khalifatullah. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, uh, uh, that's correct. You know, that is part of the uh, Islam's spiritual vision of the planet Earth. So, the, uh, but the question now, uh, have we really articulated this spiritual vision of the planet Earth and man's position in as both as Abd, as Abdullah and Khalifatullah? The two must go together, you know? not just Khalifatullah, but forgetting our role as Abdullah. Uh, so the two uh, should be, I mean, that, that, that vision should be part of our educational curriculum. Should, should, everybody should be made aware of that. Of course, not just by saying it, but presenting it in intellect, for, for university students, it means to present it in an intellectual way, in a philosophical way, uh, the, the, this question, what I call um, spiritual anthropology. We need spiritual anthropology as complement to, as complementary thing to uh, scientific anthropology. Now, the other one is I would like to take to Einstein because um, Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, of course, I mean, the, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, Nasser was, uh, uh, both of them, Nasser and Einstein were contemporaries, uh, Nasser, the younger contemporary, but uh, uh, I thought that Einstein is important to be revisited because many of the things that he said are in basically the same as the Islamic uh, position. So the issue that I'm, I would like to bring here is Einstein's um, assertion about the right relationship between science and religion. So basically, what he was saying is that there was a crisis. Of course, the, this, this crisis was before the ecological crisis. This crisis is epistemological in nature. It is crisis about relationship between science and religion. All right. Now, I would like to quote uh, his paper written in 1940. All right. Um, yes, I want to quote uh, from his paper written in 1940. The quote, even though the realms of religion and science in themselves are clearly marked off from each other, nevertheless, there exist between the two strong reciprocal relationships and dependencies. Though religion may be that which determines the goal, it has nevertheless learned from science in the broadest sense. Right? Um, yeah, the religion learned from science what means will contribute to the attainment of the goals that religion has set up. But science can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration towards truth and understanding. This source of feeling, however, springs from the sphere of religion. To this, there also belongs the faith in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational. That is comprehensive to reason. That is comprehensible to reason, sorry. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without that profound faith. The situation may be expressed by an image. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. That was the paper that he presented. Now, if I didn't tell you uh, the name Einstein, and I read first and asked you uh, who could have written that, well, I can tell you, we could, have, we could possibly, you could have mentioned well, maybe Ibn Sina or, some, or, or somebody else, or some, some Muslim from, from the medieval uh, period, because there's no difference there. So the, the, the clear message of, uh, of Einstein is that science needs a religion, and religion needs science. That also means a society 
needs both science and religion. And now I would add, by way of inference, that a society also needs a philosophy of science. So, of course, what happened in the West, I mean, the, what um, Einstein said, I mean, he, he, in a sense, he did not, the, his philosophy, which is in, in accordance with Islamic perspective, was not really given a warm reception, welcome, uh, because after him, the mainstream philosophy of science in the West, uh, critical of religion, uh, in fact, some discussions uh, close their door to religion. Uh, and um, the, uh, for, for example, there were very strong criticisms of uh, the, his, uh, his position on when he said God does not play dice. I mean, because uh, at that time, the, the growing philosophy, the more influential philosophy of science uh, was then uh, the world exists by chance. And they, of course, these people cited quantum physics, quantum uh, mechanics to prove that the, the world exists uh, by chance. But uh, Einstein defended, no, uh, he, he defended the idea that it's law and order, there is harmony uh, in the world uh, of nature. But my point is this, that the, the philosophy of science that came after Einstein was not really uh, favorable to uh, favorable to uh, religion, and it is this philosophy of science that justify uh, the in a sense the kind of science that should be used to dominate nature to extract the maximum uh, resources from, from from nature, basically uh, with no uh, with no uh, sensitivity to the question of uh, uh, the, the need to safeguard nature, the need to maintain the, the, uh, the order in, in, in nature. So I think this, um, uh, these two, uh, these two uh, scholars uh, uh, try to revive a philosophy of science that will do justice uh, to uh, the planet, uh, to, to, to the planet Earth. Now, as I said, what Einstein said is, of course, it's universal. It is very, it is very uh, universal. And um, it is a wonderful piece of uh, uh, wisdom. Uh, but in Islam, Islamic civilization, that wisdom, that truth is expressed in different ways, right? Just to show that uh, precisely because uh, there are many dimensions of religion. So maybe one scholar would choose a particular dimension of religion to be compared uh, to science. So what, 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 this is what happened. In Islamic civilization, the veritable relationship between science and religion has been expressed in several ways. For example, between revelation and reason, wahi and aqal, as emphasized by all Islamic intellectual schools, between Nakli or transmitted and akli rational, as emphasized by Al Ghazali and Ibn Khaldun, between Sharia and technology, or Sina, as emphasized by Al Farabi, and between science, Al Ain Al Tabiiya, and metaphysics, Al Ain Al Ilahi, as emphasized by Ibn Sina. So many different expressions, but the members of each pair that I've just mentioned is viewed as being in complementarity and harmony with each other. Now, I would assert that a good understanding of each of these pairs is a precondition for the formulation of the philosophy of science that is needed uh, for our present, uh, for our present uh, purpose. Now, so the, 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 this, uh, uh, what I would like to, uh, the, to, uh, to to emphasize it again also is that the question of uh, that spiritual, going back to that spiritual vision that we need, right? The spiritual vision of the, of the planet Earth. I summarize this vision as, 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 as follows, you know, um, very concise, but um, uh, just want to bring in some, some other issues here. Now, I think if we look at the whole teachings of the Quran, 
the picture, the vision that we have is this. The earth is the only planetary home for the human species. The planet earth is the only place in the physical universe which is suited for human being, for human living, which, and which could serve the true purpose, which could serve the true purpose of human existence. As described in the Quran, the true purpose of man's existence is worship of God and to successfully play the role of God's vashran. God has created the earth as a perfect planetary home for human beings. The home is perfect in every respect, but it is only a temporary one since it is not going to last forever. As God's vashran, it is man's duty to honor the trust, amana, given to him to take good care of the common planetary home. Now, we should not forget this amana because that God has given, has offered trust at first to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to accept that, 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 that offer. Humanity accepted that offer, but the Quran said uh, man uh, has been proved to be uh, to, to fail miserably. Uh, they do not really take care of that. Now, the question of this amana, I think it needs to be, to, 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 to be emphasized in the study of uh, ecology, for example. And uh, it is also important, I think, to, to, to read the issue uh, why humanity or the, or, or the human species uh, have failed to honor uh, this, uh, uh, this trust. I think uh, as, uh, it's a very important point that uh, the failure is because we have not lived according to the golden mean. To the golden mean, uh, or in Islamic terms, to the wasatiya values that described in, 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 in the Quran. So my response to the question, can we attain this objective of seeing our planet Earth becoming uh, the sustainable, I think that depends, as I said, on human behavior. I think it is only by um, going back to that uh, value, in the, in the sense, the golden mean that we will be able to, to overcome. Otherwise, uh, if we follow greed, yeah, in other words, we follow greed, uh, then the, um, even the people who are greed may, may not be the majority, but uh, the greed of even a small minority can do a lot of damage uh, to our uh, to our planet. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, in order to um, formulate, I think, in order to formulate this. Uh, uh, philosophy of science, what I call a new philosophy of science that we need for the present and, 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 and the future. Uh, there are a few issues that we need to address, to articulate, and, 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 and eventually to formulate. First, I think the uh, first idea that needs to be given new emphasis in this philosophy of science is what I call interplanetary ecology. One thing that characterizes our own time is that we know more now than our predecessors about uh, not just about our planet but also about other planets and um, if I think we'll be able to appreciate more Allah's gift of planet earth if we understand this interrelatedness and unity of the cosmos in other words interplanetary ecology, so not just intra planetary ecology confined to the Earth. Number two, the unity of the planet Earth. To see the Earth as one whole, one unit. Again, as, that, that, that is unity. Uh, both Nasser and Einstein emphasize on the unity of the cosmos, cosmic unity. What we do now is to apply that cosmic unity to just the planet Earth. Now is unity of the planet Earth. Because right now there are many, many conflicting ideas about these uh, different parts of the, of, of the planet Earth, except uh, save among the few uh, ecologies. The other one is then 
to revive teleology, to revive teleology in our philosophy of science, the concept of purpose. Why is the purpose of our planet Earth and the purpose, I think, because current philosophy of science, the mainstream, did not want to accept the concept of purpose. There's no such thing as purpose, but I think we need to reassert that. And lastly, the question of scientific truth, uh, which was emphasized by Einstein, all right? The true scientist is always in search of truth. Now, in the vocabulary of science today, the word truth has been removed. And um, in other words, it is not the, the, the scientists, many scientists believe that it is not the function, it's not the role of science to know the truth. Um, well, this is contrary to the Islamic position because in the Quran, the Quran emphasized in, in many pages, in its many pages, that God has created the heavens and the earth, bel haq, in truth, with a truth. In other words, there is a purpose. There's purpose why this thing exists. It is partly because the purpose, the meaning or the purpose of planet Earth has been lost. That contributed to the uh, degradation of the uh, of, of, of planet Earth, the, the mistreatment of the planet, irresponsible uh, treatment of the planet Earth. So thank you very much. I think roughly uh, I, that's what I think. Uh, the, the the issues that um, uh, certainly I would uh, I myself personally would like. Uh, to to give uh, to give more thought uh, to this uh, the new philosophy of science that is needed for the future of our planet Earth. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dato. Prof. Osman Bakar, for your contributions to this uh, topic today. And before we begin our question and answer session, let me once again thank. Honorable Professor Emeritus Tansi Dato Zulkifli Abdul Razak, our rector, Dato Dr. Azizan Binti Baharuddin, Director General of IKIM, Professor Dato Dr. Wan Ramli Wan Daoud, Professor of Chemical Engineering UKM, Professor Dr. Ahmad Hafiz Zulkifli, Deputy Rector for Responsible Research and Innovation of IIUM. And lastly, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Dr. Usman Bakar, for their valuable contributions to our uh, discussion uh, on towards uh, a new philosophy of science for a sustainable planet Earth Islamic perspectives. We have reached uh, almost 12.42, and we have promised to end at one uh, to our honorable uh, guest speakers so i would like to keep uh, myself uh, uh, with this deadline and therefore let me uh, just ask the questions that i have received uh, from the audience question number one uh, it comes from chi hen pe environment crisis arise from human greed and endless desires. Such desires would not be easily solved or eradicated from Western sciences point of view. Would Dato Dr. Azizan comment on this? I comment now, Professor? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Bismillah ar rahim Thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's for me, the question is significant. That's why I said at the beginning of my presentation, we need to address this topic, not just uh, to Muslims, but also to especially non-Muslims. Uh, we need to speak about the imperative of dealing with greed and other such characteristics of the human being in a scientific manner. So uh, without going into too much detail, because that will take a lot of time, we can now scientifically prove that if you are greedy, uh, in, 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 if you can talk about greed in many contexts and in many situations, it goes against the nature of the environment itself. Greed is not part of, of the environment. Therefore, whether you acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the creator at all, or, or you, whether you acknowledge or you don't acknowledge, right? 
the scientific fact is that you do not go beyond certain boundaries and limits that the earth possesses. And you learn about these boundaries through science itself. So by all means, be as scientific as you like, but you must be true to what science is telling you. So the problem is besides greed, there is also the, um, uh, the, the characteristic of kafir, you know, uh, to, to hide truth. You can be a scientist and you know that uh, you do something, something will happen, but you still can choose to hide that truth. So that's a problem. So if, even uh, on that score, you can argue with such a person that if you do hide, then you're going to cause, uh, uh, what do you call it, inevitable problems to you and to everybody else. So do you still choose to do that? So unfortunately, I think some people still choose to do that. And this is the problem with shaitan, isn't it? Uh, shaitan knows the truth about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he still chooses to go against Allah. So how do you say this to non-Muslim? I think you can choose step number one, as I um, sort of not so very well uh, uh, explained it just now, or step number two. But I still feel that using the scientific evidence, right, you, 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 can, you can go a long way in telling people that they should not do certain things. And, and greed is one of them. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Azizan, for your answer. Uh, can I request any other panelists to add to this uh, answer? Anyone would like to answer? Okay, then I move on to question number two. Uh, yes, Dato, please. Sorry? Dato, Prof, yes, welcome. Well, uh, just, uh, just to add to what uh, Professor Dato Azizan mm. has uh, mentioned, the question, uh, uh, disagreed. I mean, uh, of course, the most the most effective um, uh, treatment is provided by by religion. It's, it is it is one of the uh, issues. It's a, a perennial issue of human beings that religion seeks to, to address. Now, I think in each religion they have their own way of dealing with this with this issue. So in the West, if most many of the scientists. Of course, the scientists, not the question of whether the, the scientists that said do not, do not recognize religion. That's a, that, that, that's a problem. Uh, the point is by Professor Azizan is precisely made for those people who, who do not want religion, who believe in science, kind. So, what she's saying, all right, if they are true, if they are true to the, the, the spirit of science itself, all right, they should be able to, to recognize that. It is not. It is not good for the person in in, in question. But my point is uh, is rather is to go to to, to religion. In other words, uh, uh, that's why uh, we need a, 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 a that relationship to science and religion. How the issue of greed can be viewed from both perspective of religion and science. Uh, I think the, uh, this is something that can be further studied. Inshallah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Dato. So let me move on to next question. It is also similar to greed. Is the random felling of timber destroying forests for development, destroying mountains for quarrying works, ethical according to Makasuda Sharia? There are state governments in Malaysia that condone these acts of destruction on the environment. How ethical is that? To whom the question is addressed? The uh, question is addressed to Dr. Dr. Uh, Juan Ramli Dao specifically, but other panelists also can answer. Dr. Dr. Juan Ramli, would you like to answer this question? Uh, Prof. Tamim? Yes. It just oh, to yes, save time, please. I'm sure Prof. Ramli has got a wonderful answer. But if mm. I may just uh, respond very, very quickly, very simply, this is why uh, we also are not going to be talking only about philosophy of science, but we need also to be talking about philosophy of law philosophy of economics, philosophy of politics, 
and we, I, I tried maybe not too clearly in the beginning to say that every discipline must have an ethical basis. And the ethics in particular that we're talking about is environmental ethics. And this environmental ethics is, is got an empirical base. You do not simply destroy the forest and the, and the mountains without prior consultation with the experts, okay? I mean, you do it first and then you see the problem, uh, for example, at Kim Kim River in Johor now. You understand what I'm trying to say? We, we, we don't mess things up and then we, we try to figure out. We, we have enough knowledge now, uh, but we just don't have enough uh, advocates to ensure that in the, in the legal system, okay, we, we have these environmental ethics uh, foundations so that before planners actually do their work and, and you know, give the uh, uh, permission or the license for developments to take place, they are completely in the know. So the question is, uh, uh, the people who are in the know, have they taken all steps to make sure that what needs to be known is already made known to the policymakers? So I would not want to be pointing fingers. It's, it's good to highlight the problems, but I think everybody has a share in creating this awareness. And I would, I would like to suggest that every discipline has a small portion of history and philosophy of whatever yeah, that is linked to sustainability. Thank you so much. Sorry, okay. Prof. Wan. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Wan, would you like to answer also to this question from your perspective? Can I read that question again to you? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, is the random felling of timber destroying forests for development, destroying mountains for quarrying works ethical according to the Makashi the Sharia? There are state governments in Malaysia that condone these acts of destruction on the environment. How ethical is that? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I can't answer for the state government, but I can say that of, uh, the destruction of uh, the forests and the mountains yeah, is unethical yeah, because it destroys uh, communities of uh, creatures of makhluk yeah, uh, in, the, in the forest. Yeah? and destroy the balance yeah um, i think many people don't understand the concept of balance you know they say why do the orang asli complain logging in one area while their settlement are quite far away but um, the uh, forest is uh, an ecosystem where if you destroy one part of it uh, the effect will not only be seen in that part only uh, and not in the same form. Yeah? Uh, the effect could be felt uh, a few months afterwards in the settlement yeah? because <coughs> the ecosystem, the <coughs> hydrology, the uh, communities of the various uh, or the biodiversity to use a modern verb uh, is destroyed. And because of that, there are gaps, missing gaps where uh, it's no longer sustainable to maintain the, uh, the biodiversity. And uh, so the Orang Asli settlement, even is already 10 to 20 kilometers from the area, logging area, will be affected because the hydrology is all connected. If you destroy the forest cover, you change the hydrology, right? rivers might become dry, yeah? And or might be filled fill up or flooding and so on. So there must be a greater understanding of the ecosystem of the communities that are dependent upon each other and the, and the precarious uh, balance and equilibrium that exists between them that maintain the, the forest and also our own uh, source of water as well, yes. So um, it, it could be Sharia compliant, but it's not uh, Islamically ethical, okay. yeah. It could be compliant. I mean, you have the, all the laws and all the, the legal uh, licenses and whatnot. It's all legal, <laughs> all compliant, 
uh, and Makasit Sharia is also made uh, is also there, yeah, for the needs of the people, yeah, um, uh, yeah. The state government needs the money, uh, and the industry needs uh, wood, timber, and so on. So Makasit Sharia is fulfilled, but the ethics is not fulfilled at all. It's unethical to destroy forests. Yeah, okay. and um, that's why it, it's better to have what we call a uh, plantation forest rather than uh, destroying virgin forests or catchment areas. Yeah, I think some countries do have this, uh, this uh, arrangement where they are only allowed to, um, to get timber from plantation forests, not from the virgin forest. Yeah, and there's a difference between a plantation forest and virgin forest, yeah? you actually plant the trees for timber and you have a plan, a sustainable plan to regrow them, right? And mostly plantation uh, timber are uh, short lived uh, or short, uh, what do you call it, each uh, uh, plants, yeah? That could be harvested after two or three years and then you can grow it quite fast as well, all right? Whereas uh, if you lose a virgin forest, it takes a few hundred years to, to recover, yeah? And won't, you won't see it in your own lifetime. So that's why I say you, you could be Sharia compliant, you satisfy all the Marcos Sharia and you follow all the laws, but it's still unethical because you are going to destroy forests, yeah? And um, the problem is, um, uh, the Sharia doesn't have uh, uh, a particular law for Fasad Fil Ar. Yeah, it's, it's not uh, there. So you can't prosecute them on uh, Sharia, yeah? Fasad Fil Ar, because the uh, Hudud is only for certain crimes that doesn't include Fasad Fil Ar, the actual Fasad Fil Ar, I mean, destruction of the earth, yeah? Uh, so um, that's why depending on Makosit Sharia only doesn't solve the problem, right? Because it's Sharia compliant, but it's unethical. Uh, it, it doesn't do justice to the uh, people. So there must be an understanding the difference between ethics and law. Yeah, it's not the same. It could be lawful, but unethical and unjust. Yes. I think that my answer to that. Okay. Thank you, Dato, for your answer. Let me move on to the next question. Uh, is it true that the religion that is meant by Einstein refers to the concept of Spinoza and not a traditional religion which has beliefs about personal God? Let me repeat this question, which comes from Nuruddin Akbar, specifically to Prof. Dato Usman Bakar. Is it true that the religion that is meant by instinct refers to the concept of Spinoza and not a traditional religion <clears throat> which has beliefs about personal God? <clears throat> Spinoza. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yes, Prof. Dato. No. Am I allowed to address a question? <clears throat> yes, 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 Prato. You should I repeat the question, Dato? Well, I'm trying to answer answer the question. I understand yes, the please, question. Please. I understand the question. Now, from the perspective of Islamic theology, yeah, uh, mainly the theology of divine and these divine names manifest themselves or disclose themselves, the process called Tajalli, all right? Now, that applies to names that are normally considered or rather considered by some as personal and the others are not personal. But you see, is, that is basically that is Western Christian theology, all right? Now, let's say now, let's say God, the be Beautiful. Is that personal God or 
impersonal God. Quran. So it, the answer from, from, from Islam is it is different. I mean, all divine names are personal. So these names, I, I, I know Einstein, Albert Einstein, uh, was influenced by Spinoza. Uh, although he used the word pantheism, I don't think that Einstein prescribes pantheism because pantheism means to believe in the identity or rather the identification of God and creation. Because Einstein talks about God revealing himself in the laws of nature, which that is not pantheism, all right? Uh, it is true that Einstein believes that uh, every part of the cosmos points to the existence of, of God. So, uh, that, and um, uh, that cannot be said to be uh, even, no, 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 not related to the concept of personal God. So the problem now, what do you understand by personal God? Is it meant by Christianity or some other religion or in Islam? We go back to the concept of the divine names in Islam. You cannot say some divine names are not personal and some others are personal. There are so many divine names when first in nature. This is a download from BFM 89.9. <laughs> Dato, you have answer? Okay. Let me move on to another question. Anybody would like to add? No. Okay. This comes this question comes from Tansri Ramli Nathali, specifically to Prof. Dato Dr. Wan Ramli. Would be grateful if Professor Wan Ramli could enlighten us further on Malay being the first to, to develop the zero and the decimal system in the seventh century. Where could I read materials on this? Yes, Dato. Yes, uh, the zero um, was discovered on uh, a, a, a stale, a stale or a, a stone inscription, yeah, in uh, two places. One in um, um, Funan, uh, which is modern day Cambodia, and the other in uh, uh, Palembang, yeah, Kedukan Bukit. And on both uh, stone inscription, there is uh, the year 608, yeah? I can show you a picture, I can share uh, a picture for you. Uh, uh, can you see it? So this is uh, on the uh, Funan uh, stone inscription, yeah? Uh, this is 608. So the dot is zero. So that's the, um, the number, yeah? Zero, discovery zero. There's another uh, still uh, at Kedukan Bukit, Palembang, also giving the same number. This number is the, the uh, Saka year, 608. Saka is a Malay calendar um, starting from uh, sometime 60 AD, if I'm not mistaken. Eh? 60 AD is zero Saka. So 608 is around 68 uh, something. Yeah? And then also there are uh, numbers using the decimal system in the Kedukan Bukit. You have uh, Saribu and you have Duaratus. Yeah. Uh, so these are all um, decimal system uh, in that uh, on that uh, uh, stone. And you can you can find this if you if you Google uh, discovery of zero in the Malay world or in Cambodia or. Uh, you can also Google Kedukan Bukit, uh, which is the, the stone uh, inscription, yeah, uh, where the date is given uh, with a zero. And also the uh, numbers Saribu and uh, Duaratos and so on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dato. And this question uh, is posed to Transfer uh, Honorable Rector. 
will nuclear energy be permissible to reduce carbon emission will nuclear energy be permissible to reduce carbon emission well um nuclear energy of course uh, is a zero emission uh, technology but uh, it has the risk of uh, nuclear proliferation that is the use of nuclear material to make uh, atomic weapon nuclear weapons and as well as the making of dirty bombs by terrorists right these are the two main main concern of the nuclear power yeah because in a nuclear power station um uranium uh reacts and produce uh daughter atoms yeah uh, like plutonium which uh, could be used uh could be concentrated and used to make um nuclear bombs yeah so uh, that is the downside and it also has the risk of contaminating the environment with um uh radioactive material if you look at chernobyl and fukushima the the effect of the contamination of radioactive material from the uh nuclear power is is quite extensive and wide ranging yeah and causes long term illnesses and also um it it also makes the land around the area where where the contamination occurs uh, could not be uh, inhabited nor could be used for agriculture so the effect is quite uh, yeah so um but there is an uh, an alternative nuclear technology that could not be that could not be flow related which is the like molten salt liquid thorium uh, reactor yeah which is uh much safer it doesn't produce plutonium uh, and it doesn't produce uh a uh, long term uh, uh, um, radioactive material like uh, produced by uranium so uh, much safer is is difficult for terrorists to make dirty bombs it, you cannot make uh, up, up a, you cannot make plutonium and you cannot uh, make a nuclear bomb from it so i think uh, if the nuclear industry uh, transition to uh, liquid uh, molten liquid uh, um, sorry liquid molten salt uh, thorium reactor um, then the nu- nuclear technology will be much much safer and could be used as a zero emission uh, energy technology but as it is um the uh, nuclear industry is still using um the uranium technology um the 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 only thing is they they now use mixed solid oxide that mean they mix thorium with uranium but still there's a lot of uranium in it yeah the reason is because it's cheaper to buy off the shelf uh, nuclear power technology uh, conventional nuclear power technology whereas the uh, liquid molten salt uh, thorium uh, uh, power uh, reactor is is still at uh, pilot plant stage but uh, if you want to use a nuclear power for zero emission you need to reduce the proliferation and uh, contamination uh, risk thank you okay thank you very much i have many questions but our time is uh, now 110 i would like to pose one last question and this can be answered by transri rector and professor uh, dr ahmed hafiz we came to know that vaccination for coronavirus has been discovered by some countries and it has been distributed globally at the same time there are critiques by scientists who doubt the methodology applied in the process of discovering the medicine for coronavirus how muslim philosophers of science view this transri 
thank you very much. I guess the best person to answer with uh, Prof Hafiz. From my, <laughs> from my point of view, I think my critique on the vaccination is basically still on, not on the ethical line. Mm. I mean, that is my critics. Basically, you can see at the end of the day, it is still about economics. It's still about greed. It is still about, you know, uh, the Western uh, e economy serving themselves first as compared to the world over. I mean, the, the, the statement by the Secretary General of the United Nations is very clear. Ten countries in the West has maybe used 75% of the vaccine, whereas none of the developing countries yet to deliver uh, their vaccine. So uh, while, while the whole invention of a vaccine may be useful, but I think, again, this, oh, 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 the whole question of delivery, I think, is what we are talking of today. How do you get this thing out, be, be it knowledge, be it products, be it whatever it is? How do the whole idea of ethics, uh, justice, uh, balance, which is fundamental in the kind of sustainability that we talk about, can be actually envisaged? So if that is not done, then I think the rest can be just utilitarian. I mean, some of the question that was answered or was asked, because the science that we've got now is a utilitarian science. Uh, we don't have philosophy. I don't, I don't understand philosophy of science. We never teach philosophy of science or anything for that matter, even in philosophy of education. So we just look at this as something that we can sell. And we are, we are encouraged to do that. Innovation is about selling, making money. What it does to the environment is number two. I mean, the question why we destroy uh, our environment is basically just that. You know, it's a question of utilitarian, what you get out of it, rather how does it serve purpose for, for the people around us. Right? And, and I, I want to add this one. I think at the end of the day, we don't have to wait for, for, for policies. We don't have to wait for big things to happen. I think we should take the, the initiative ourselves. This university has taken its initiative. That's why we call our, our, our research as responsible research not just research and development. We call it responsible because we want the word ethics to be there, the consultations and the thing that we talked about will actually differentiate the research that IIM do and the research that everyone else does. Yeah, Academy of Science, we are part of Academy of Science. I seldom hear Academy of Science talk about this to the government. I mean, we are supposed to be the custodian of science. We have not talked about it. We just talk about the good things. We don't want to talk about the bad things. So the ethics and courage must come together. There is ethics, there's no courage, then there's not non ethics also, also. So these are the issues that I think we need to talk about, the more subline issues, rather than just the numbers game that we talked about. So Afis, over to you. Prof. Hafiz, more importantly, the content of the vaccination, to what extent the halalness or the halality is there? I think uh, for the halal, I think there's not much a question since most of the uh, uh, product didn't involve animals. Okay. And even for the AstraZeneca, there have been questions by the Indonesians. They rebut back that the uh, uh, process didn't involve any porcine or the uh, porcine based uh, agent. There are, there are questions about the effectiveness of the vaccine. That's why the science, uh, some of the scientists are questioning. And the process of getting the vaccine from the bench to the people are too fast. There are certain things, that's why even in the in FDA consider it as a uh, emergency vaccinations because of the numbers of people who actually got the virus and actually died because of the virus uh, above the number that they expected. This occur, I think, because we already have the, uh, some scientific knowledge of vaccine, how it works, but this is the, I think, among the first mRNA, the single-stranded RNA virus that had been uh, vaccinated. Okay, HIV, AIDS also having the nRNA, but we didn't have the vaccine until now for the last, I think when uh, the first AIDS was there in the, in the world in 1984, when it was discovered until now, uh, almost uh, 30 years, we didn't have this vaccine. But with this COVID-19, within a year, 
some belief within six months, we develop this virus, uh, the vaccine. Uh, the vaccine is multiple in nature. There are certain things they take it direct from the, uh, the virus. There are certain uh, company make it, uh, they divide the virus and actually accumulate that. And this actually trigger the body to create the uh, defense. Doesn't mean that if let's say you get the vaccine, you didn't get the COVID. The only thing that they, uh, they say is that with the vaccine, you may get COVID, but then the severity may be less. Okay. And we may need um, to understand these uh, results of the vaccines another two or three years when the mass is already in the market. And then we may, need, uh, we may know about the side effect of the vaccine. Uh, the clinical trial that have been done, although it was not been published, usually they publish the, pub, uh, the results of the vaccine in the uh, journals. If let's say they already have uh, the clinical trial one, clinical trial two, or clinical trial three, the numbers that they go for the clinical trial two before the uh, randomized trial for clinical trial three, I think uh, some of the uh, vaccine have been questioned. I think that's why uh, some of the scientists are worried about this. I think that's the answer that we know until now. Okay, Prof. Okay, Prof. Uh, Ahmed Hafiz for your response. Now the time is 1.15. Uh, although we have a number of questions, we cannot answer. Inshallah, we will compile those questions and forward them to our panelists. And I would like to request my respected panelists to give us uh, uh, a short article based on your presentation so that ISTA can publish and the whole world can benefit from that. So with this, I would like to thank once again my respected professors and colleagues such as Tansri Professor uh, Zulkifli Abdul Razak, our Honorable Rector, Dato Dr. Azizan Binti Bakharuddin, the Director General of IKIM, Professor Dato Dr. Wan Ramli Wan Daoud, Professor of Chemical Engineering of UKM, Professor Dr. Ahmed, Haf, Ahmed Hafiz Zulkifli, our Deputy Director for Responsible Research and Innovation of UIA, and lastly, Professor Emeritus Dr. Dr. Usman Bakar. Uh, with these, I would also thank my uh, audience, respected audience, uh, who have been sitting from 9.30 until 1.15, listening to our valuable uh, presentations of uh, well-established scientists of this country. So with this, I thank once again uh, for your contributions and thought-provoking uh, answers to questions raised by the audience. Thank you all very much. And before I conclude, may I respectfully inf invite Honorable Tansri Rector to, to give a few words, the, the remarks, uh, so that okay. you can take home okay. your remarks and move forward and lead forward, inshallah. Thank you very much. I think time in the interest of time, uh, I would like to just thank everybody uh, for this uh, very exciting uh, and very inspiring. All, always, I mean, I get my education uh, through this. The last, the, the last two uh, webinars give a lot more pointers, uh, make us more confident. But the only thing, how do we organize ourselves to get this information out? And inshallah, that will be the next thing that we will discuss. And I hope we will have the other next webinar uh, along the same line uh, to, to reset or perhaps to revisit. But certainly things will not remain the same as we move forward. So thank you very much, uh, Azizan, uh, uh, Dato Wan Ramli, of course, the homegrown uh, uh, Professor Osman Baka. The next webinar, get, give him the first speaker. He always get the last speaker by the time... <laughs> By the time he wants to speak, of course, he has a lot to say, but I think we want to listen to him first rather than being the last speaker all the time. Dato, uh, actually, hope you... actually we, we were thinking to give space for the guests first. Oh, so okay. we are insiders. So insiders, <laughs> the, the hosts are always 
at the last. Okay. Okay. Inshallah, in the next webinar, we give him the first chance. Inshallah. Yeah, the, the director can be the last this time, like this time. I give it, give it to uh, Professor Usman. And thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well. Inshallah, we'll make dua that everything is good for us and the Ummah, Inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi yeah. ta'ala wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we have our next webinar on 26th of April. The topic of that webinar is decolonization and Islamization of the social sciences, convergence and divergence. Again, we have invited five speakers who are experts in the field of decolonization and Islamization. And we will invite you also as our uh, respected uh, listeners of that particular forum. So with this, uh, we end our discussion.